Number 10, snake milker. So this job extracts venom from snakes for medical or research purposes, or in earlier times for war. Well, it still kind of exists today, it's not like how it used to be. They handle some of the most deadly snakes on earth. So for in modern times, you know, milkers use the extracted venom to create anti-venom antidotes. But during ancient civilization, they used to use venom to soak swords or arrows for use as biological warfare. How, um, resourceful, I suppose? Number nine, bring out the dead. So when the Black Plague knocked out roughly half a year up in the 14th century, bodies littered the streets. The job of plague body collectors was invented, which required the worker to collect bodies using only a cart, a rag to cover their faces, and flowers which were believed to prevent collectors from contracting the disease. You know, good old ring around the rosy. As much as there's not a lot to say about this job, since it's pretty straightforward, the risks were high, and many folks passed from disease just trying to make a living. Number eight, powder monkey. If you thought being a chimney sweep was brutal on young people, wait till you hear what they had to do during seaborne warfare during the Age of Sail. From the 16th century onwards, young people served as powder monkeys on sailing vessels all around the world. Boys as young as, um, years old, were tasked with carrying live explosives and ferrying explosive powder all over naval ships and merchant boats. Most of these boys had been orphaned somewhere in their early life. Naval vessels needed small people to move explosive rounds and other war-related materials around tiny holes throughout the ships, and the gig was deadly simply by the nature of the job requirements, so adults were wise to avoid it at all costs. Just get a little one to do it. Also, most adult men were simply too big for tiny ship holes, so the ship captains turned to the young folks for the awful role. During the battle, these boys would run up and down into the ship's hold to grab sacks of explosive powder. They would scurry back up to the deck to hand deliver the powder to the cannon crew, then they'd go run back down to make another, you know, run for explosives. As you might expect, being in such close quarters to explosives while cannons are going off all around you isn't exactly a good spot to be in. But these people had no other recourse and no land going future waiting for them back home. So they died in anonymity and in great numbers, undoubtedly far greater than we may ever know considering their low status. Speaking of low status, these young people were amazingly used by ship crews even into the early 20th century. During the Civil War, for example, Union and Confederate ships both employed young folks to help their battle effort. These boys were typically the lowest status crewmen on board. Most were paid less than $6 a month for their unsung and extremely deadly efforts, and many perished in ocean battles and unpredictable explosions throughout the duration of the civil conflict. Number seven, food tasters. So, back in the day, many kings, queens, and emperors hired food tasters whose sole job was to make sure the royal's food wasn't poisoned. Although tasters risked their lives by eating possibly poisoned food, they also got to enjoy some of the most delicious and expensive food that members of the royal family ate. It's kind of a trade-off, you know, yummy food, but at the same time, you're at risk no matter what. Hopefully your food wasn't poisoned. Number six, ancient Rome chariot racers. So these were among the most popular and celebrated members of society back in ancient Rome. They were the celebrities, competing in coliseums. They drew a large fan base because of their high-speed racing and aggressive styles. But here's the thing, reins were tied around their wrists, so if they were overturned, game over for you. And hey, as time went on, their sidekicks were also subject to certain death. So for modern context, you know the people who remove and replace tires on Formula 1 cars faster than most of us can even drive? Well, an arming squire was basically the medieval equivalent of that. Their job involved maintaining, fixing, and applying a knight's armor, sometimes mid-battle. And no, they weren't wearing any armor themselves as they were rushing in. To add insult to injury, they also had to remove the spilled redness, sweat, mud, and goodness knows what else from the armor after a fight. And of course, uh, what did they use to clean with? Aged urine. No thanks. Number five, a trench runner. So as bad as the Second World War was from a pure fatality standpoint, World War I was Kinda worse. The Great War, as it was known at the time, saw millions of horrendous casualties as new technologies swept across the battlefield. From noxious gases being used pretty liberally, to fighter pilots diving high overhead during, you know, what they were doing, soldiers on all sides of the Great War experienced terrible ways to perish, and perhaps the worst of those manners was working as a runner. They were used to send signals and messages from trench to trench, and battalion to battalion during the war. Wireless communication technology was very much a theory more than a practical application at the time, and what little wireless ability there was often faltered at the slightest weather problem or technical issue. Well, still kind of the same today. 
So, young soldiers were tasked to become runners when messages needed to get out there. Those men were almost always very low-ranking non-commissioned officer, and they all had just one trait in common. They had to be physically fit. Hey, that's in their job title after all. So when a battalion needed to get a message out, they would task the runner with sprinting up and out of the trench and going into the open plain. There, they would have to run like hell to whichever other trench needed to hear their fellow soldiers' plans. These messengers were forced to pop up over the relative safely of the trenches and come under immediate fire from the other side. The phrase, don't kill the messenger, far predates this time period, of course, but it's not like soldiers followed its suggestion anyways. When runners popped up to deliver messages to other areas, they were kind of, bingo, target. Soldiers frustrated by the drudgery and terror of trench warfare use these runners as target practice. Artillery shells and incendiary devices far beyond what was necessary to kill, you know, just one soldier were aimed at these poor men. And for many men buried deep down the trenches, a runner's presence might be the only action they saw for days. So they cherished the opportunity to uh, get an easy kill. With a runner, a World War I vet commented years later, it was merely a question of how long they would last before it was the end of their life, which is pretty grim. Number four, a Greek fire operator. So this was basically an ancient flamethrower. It was used during the Byzantine Empire during its wars and conquests as early as the fifth century. Historians know now that it was very infamously used several times to save Constantinople from invasions. And most notably, Greek fire was employed as a vicious flame tossing defense against, you know, yeah, those forces. Now, accounts for the time claim Greek fire was a flame technology spurred on by piping in water. So only other substances like urine, sand, or vinegar were able to douse the flames. As centuries old accounts claim, Greek fire operators were ordered to fire the water-based liquid through bronze tubes at a target. Now, these tubes were usually on ships, but some battles employ their use on land as well. The liquid had been preheated and pressurized, so when it was, you know, Sent out of the tubes, it sometimes went nearly 100 feet. Through the pressurization, it would catch fire as it was, you know, released, and it would send out a volley of fatal flames. Of course, it wasn't just, you know, this empire's enemies who would have suffered at the hands of the fire. The primitive technologies of the time would have undoubtedly ensured the men operating the device were constantly, and excuse the pun, going down in flames as well. Statistics for that type of fiery death are impossible to determine today, of course, but we know based on historians' interpretations of ancient texts that Greek fire was a feared battle tactic all throughout the region. We also know that ships on which it was employed often got fired themselves amid the chaos of war. In that sense, this empire's greatest weapon of war also proved to be one of its most terribly deadly manners of self-inflicting wounds. Amazingly, historians aren't entirely sure how to recreate Greek fire today. The weapon has been documented and was noted quite a bit in historical tracts written during and after the uh, empire's run, but aside from general explanations of the fire technology, specific instructions have never been found. It hasn't been used much in other recent history by other empires either, so today historians wonder whether the now lost secret of Greek fire was simply discarded because it proved far too deadly to those in charge of, you know, weapons. Number three, a lime burner. So lime mortar has been a crucial building material since around the first century BC, but it takes a lot to turn its chalky origins into the cement-like finished product. Workers were needed to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium-rich stone, which is where lime burners stepped in. Their job involved heating limestone in a kiln at around mm, 800 degrees Celsius, exposing themselves to harmful carbon monoxide and suffocating chalk dust. And hey, if that wasn't enough, the finished product was prone to um, kabooming when it came into contact with water. So have fun with that. Number two, petardiers. So if you haven't heard of this profession yet, it's probably because the position only existed during late medieval and early renaissance times, and also because most folks don't really uh, live to talk about their position. The job involves teams of around seven men placing petards, a rudimentary kind of explosive, as close to their enemy's defense line as possible during sieges. Think like fortress walls, tunnels, and more. Oh, and if they weren't already worried about enemy fire, the 100 pound petard itself was liable to go kaboom at pretty much any given time. Hence the phrase, hoisted by his own petard. And here I thought it was a euphemism for something. Pardon me, why? Number one, tin openers. Submarine technology was bad enough during the Second World War, as you know, we all kind of know, but a few decades earlier, we're going back to World War I, it was a far more rudimentary and thus even more deadly situation. So while there weren't as many men going down into the depths, and therefore not the same raw number of fatalities, at least one Great War water gag proved truly terrible, and these men were known as the Tin Openers, and their job was to secure submarines from enemy interests after they were sunk deep down to the ocean bottom. Basically, both the Allies and the Germans had a ton of coded messages and cryptologic communications on board their submarines back in the day. So when a submarine was sunk by an opponent, the vessel's remnants became highly prized as they drifted down to the seafloor. 
Recognizing this, the British Royal Navy started employing teams of deep sea divers to raid sunken German U boats. The Navy's hope was that these men could come away with ciphers, codes, and keys to secret messages. And in turn, those ciphers could theoretically help the British intercept and translate other future German military messages. Which, hey, seems like a great idea, right? Why not go behind enemy lines and steal their submarine signals? Well, there's like one teeny tiny problem. The men tasked with diving down to get this intel died very, very often. For starters, most submarines were sunk in areas where there were active open ocean minefields. So many divers were just, you know, blown up in mine explosions long before reaching the seafloor. For the lucky few that did make it down to the sunken subs, most of those wasted vessels still had active torpedoes and other live ammunition rounds. Okay, explosives aside, the very act of diving deep into the North Atlantic often to depths of hundreds of feet or greater, was its own terrible journey. Dive suit technology was not nearly as good as it is today, so oxygen pipes often faltered, and the unbearable pressure of the depths forced many men to succumb in gruesome and grisly ways. Being so far beneath the surface meant that small mistakes quickly festered, and there was no medic help down in those depths. Yeah, these folks had an important job, but it was awful. At number 10, water carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything. We have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water, for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number 9, Town Crier. I'm sure you've heard of the Town Crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the Town Crier, you might also think of the famous Hear Ye, Hear Ye that is associated with the speeches of the Town Criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the Town Crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The Town Crier would often make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase, hear ye, hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye, 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 which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. At number seven, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator and their job was to oversee the day-to-day -day running of a manor as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord and served as a Reeve for a one year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number six, Peddler. 
This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case by case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. At number five, Gong Farmer. Now, now, even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits and so they would be given a large ladle and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. Now, as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the Middle Ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of, and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the Middle Ages, and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently, people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, Cupbearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self-explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cup bearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cup bearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number two, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business, but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the alewife was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally, at number one, alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the Middle Ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. 
These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things, and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. At number 10, Groom of the Stool. There were a lot of really horrible jobs back in the Middle Ages. I mean, these people literally took any task you could think of and turned it into an actual profession. From fetching water from the nearest stream to handing drinks to people, everyone had some kind of job. But with that said, some jobs were worse than others, and here's one of them. The Groom of the Stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry a commode around at all times, waiting for the king to do his business, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have to, quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. You know you're well off when you hire someone just to take care of your bodily business. Talk about a crappy job. At number nine, kissing sheets. For thousands of years, one of the biggest threats that people of royal or high status had to worry about was being taken out by their enemies. Monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies as it was one of the most common methods of offing someone. So they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed every morning. They would kiss the pillows, the sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning his clothes too, as well as his sons, and so they would be tested for poison before they got dressed. Henry VIII was really out here providing employment for just about every weird task you could think of. Before we carry on talking about some of the strangest professions from back in the Middle Ages, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Leech Collector. Back in the Middle Ages, things were still quite underdeveloped, like medicine for example. In our last video, I told you guys about alchemists who, at the time, were pretty much the ones who sought out cures for different ailments. Because science wasn't really known to them back then, they tried using whatever they could find to create cures, and one of the most common things that were used in medicine were leeches. Now, as we've learned by now, anything could become a job in the Middle Ages, and so gathering leeches became a profession. What's even weirder than the fact that finding leeches was someone's job is the method of how they collected those bad boys. Leech collectors would wade into the water with bare legs and wait for the leeches to come to them. They would swish around and try to gather as many leeches on their body as possible. They would then get out of the water and pry the leeches off, putting them into a bucket and selling them to people in town like barber surgeons and other medical professionals. Now I can't say I've ever had a leech on me, so I don't really know what it feels like, but I can imagine that it's an uncomfortable feeling, so to have a bunch of them all over you must have been a nightmare. At number seven, fuller. Wool was a very important part of life for people back in the Middle Ages. They were able to make all sorts of things out of it, and because it was waterproof because of the natural oils in the wool, it made processing the wool quite easy. But soon people found out that whatever they made out of the wool ended up being quite coarse and frayed easily. They figured that if they removed the oil from the wool, then it would make the overall product a little nicer, which it did, but the oil removing process definitely wasn't pleasant. Back then, in order to get the oils off wool, people called fullers would process the wool by pouring stale urine over it and then stomping on it. They needed some kind of alkaline solution to dissolve the oils and urine was the best and most abundant solution. What makes this extra gross though is the fact that when it came to big batches of wool, they would have needed the urine of a bunch of people to get the job done. So that means that the fuller would have been sloshing around in the urine of like half the town. 
gross. At number six, Ostiary. In the Middle Ages, religion played a big part in the lives of the people, and there were actually quite a few jobs centered around having something to do with the church. This is true with Ostiaries, who worked almost like a secretary for the church. This position was normally held by a man who wanted to move up in the church's hierarchy. He was basically doing a menial task to butt kiss his way to the top. Ostiaries were tasked with being kind of like a church bouncer. They would make sure that unbaptized people didn't come into the church during certain times, and they would also man the doors during baptisms. This profession was based on the Roman habit of having a slave guard the doors of their master's house. At number five, bear leader. Now here's a really strange job from the Middle Ages, which sounds both terrifying, but also kind of cool. Back in the Middle Ages, blood sports were all the rage. Many of the monarchs who ruled during this time were obsessed with watching blood sports, which honestly kind of explains a lot, but that's besides the point. One of the most popular blood sports was bear baiting, which involved making a pack of dogs fight a bear. Sounds gruesome, but it also begs the question, well, where did you get the bear? Well, that's where bear leaders came into play. For bear leaders, their whole job was to lead bears from village to village so that they could participate in blood sports. Now it sounds super dangerous because, well, we're talking about a big bear, but imagine how much of a flex that would be to say, yeah, I wrangle bears for a living. Like, how cool would that be? Now that's something to put in your Tinder bio. And number four, the piss prophet. As we all know, medicine wasn't all that advanced in the Middle Ages. There were no actual doctors, and the people you would have visited if you were feeling unwell were the same people who doubled as barbers, so I don't know how accurate their medical diagnosis would be. In medieval England, people didn't really know much about health, and many people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. The people who collected people's urine samples were called piss prophets, and they had their own criteria for determining what was going on in someone's body based on their urine. According to the piss prophets, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then it meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were because medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. At number three, muckraker. In our last video about unusual jobs from the Middle Ages, I told you guys about a job where people had to clean up human waste with ladles and then transport it elsewhere to keep the town clean. But there's another profession along those same kind of lines that I'd like to tell you about. Muckrakers were the people who were responsible for cleaning waste off the streets in whatever town they were in. You see, back then, people kind of just disposed of their waste wherever they pleased. But since this waste, like human and animal excrement, rotting food, and entrails had nowhere to go and kind of just sat around the streets, you can just imagine how disgusting that must have been. So that's where muckrakers came in. These were brave people who basically rode around town, collecting waste off the ground and throwing it into carts to then be transported out of the city. As horrible as this job may sound though, these people actually made a lot of money. Muckrakers could make in 11 days the same amount as another laborer makes in 6 months. Would you do this job if it made you rich? At number 2, Arming Squires. I've talked about squires in a previous list about medieval knights, and if you've watched that video, then you might be familiar with how unpleasant the life of a squire could be. At a certain point in their training, a squire would be tasked with basically being an assistant to a knight, and a lot of their assistance was guided towards the knight's armor and weaponry. In the Middle Ages, arming squires were given the task of maintaining the knight's armor. So this meant that they had to make sure that the armor was clean and properly attached to the knight's body. This job was so serious that sometimes the arming squire would have to run out into the battlefield in the middle of a fight to tend to their knight's armor, which meant that they were risking their lives for a couple hunks of metal. And finally, at number one, peer finders. Now I think this last job on our list must be one of the worst ones by far. We've talked about how people harvested leeches, cleaned waste off the streets, and stomped on urine-soaked wool, but imagine if your job was just to go around the town and pick up as much dog poop as you possibly could. This was basically what people called peer finders would do. Dog poop was essentially used as a drying agent by tanneries to make leather for bookbinding. This was a lot of people's full-time jobs, but imagine how crappy this job would have been. I'll see myself out. Number 10, farming. 
In a world with a lack of food, not because I ate it all, which is honestly a good reason, peasantry had to work on their farms, not only to feed the rich, but also themselves. So if the men in your household are ill or sick, then that means it's rivet rosy time. Or farming friend time, whatever you want to call it. I don't need to tell any farmer out there how tough their job can be. Being a medieval woman farmer, that's tough. Also, they probably weren't allowed to wear clothing that was more suitable for plowing fields. And of course, there's a woman trying to do a man's job. How dare she? People just should have let them be. There's a good chance the crops wouldn't make it either. A green thumb would have come in very handy. A tough job nonetheless. Number nine, beer maiden. This one goes out to any woman who's ever had the pleasure of working at a certain restaurant that's fixated on women's chests. You know the one I'm talking about. Or any woman who had the absolute pleasure of working at a golf course clubhouse. Keep your mitts to yourself, you filthy animals. I can't imagine the bar maidens of yieldy times had better luck. There really aren't a lot of laws to protect them either. But basically, they helped serve ale in the taverns and inns, which brought in all kinds of unsavory types. Mind you, it's not as bad as it would be in Skyrim or you know other fantasy RPGs, but it's still a sour bunch. Sometimes there were just barrels of ale and the maiden's job was to simply just keep filling the tankards and handing them out. I'm sure she was well respected and not even once ever had her personal space infringed upon, right? Of course not, no. Number eight, caring for children. Hey, someone had to do it. A woman's job is never done. At least that's what my mom, my aunt, uh, my grandma and pretty much every woman I've ever known has always said. Okay, sure, I was a little bit of a handful. I was loud and energetic and, and I loved to talk. Teachers always said I was a distraction in class. All right, maybe I was, and maybe I still am. Okay, I am. But at least the women caring for me had the modern amenities of the 21st century. A fridge full of fresh food, washing machines, cars, and a solid structure with four walls. So you can imagine if you had to deal with a kid like me back in ye olde times, just with none of the nice stuff that makes life today a lot of fun. Ye olde Chetty running amok. Oh, mother, mother. Number seven, the streets. Unusual to most, but very common to women of ye olde times. When you're a woman who's got nothing, sometimes you gotta give something. That something just so happens to be what's hiding in your pants. It's a profession that's as old as time, and it will not be going anywhere anytime soon. Women work the streets. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. Number six, Joan of Arc. It doesn't get more unusual than the savior of France. England and France were having a go at it if you will, which if you know history was like round 12 of 100. Anyway, it wasn't going too well for France, it was going rather poor actually. The same kind of poor I got on my report cards under the paying attention section. Oops. Then there was Joan, really a, a nobody, when one day she heard the voice from a higher power that she was to drive the English out of France. Naturally, the people around her, especially the men, scoffed at the thought of a young woman being the hero they needed. But given that they had nothing to lose, suited her up and sent her out. Plot twist, she did very well, like crazy good. The Battle of Orléans proving her grit. The English were so confused and disgruntled by a young peasant girl defeating their armies, they thought it was only proof of one thing, that she wasn't a sign of God, but rather a sign of the devil. How dare a woman beat us in, that's man stuff, you can't do that. Number five. Queen. It is unusual. Most people didn't get to be royal. I mean, think about it, seriously. Although I certainly like to be. I can't just imagine it. King of the internet. King of the black hoodie. Nice. Or king of the Chinese buffet. My point is that while women in medieval times didn't get the respect that they deserved, and every girl does, queens just had it better. And that's unusual. The queen might not have been as well respected as the king, but compared to the peasantry, she was fed. Had four walls around her that didn't leak or wind would you know, seep through or blow down, and wasn't working herself to the grave every day to provide for a king and queen that didn't think very much about them. That's a really hard life to live. Number four, cooking. Chief, somebody had to do it. Although, there's something that tells me the food wasn't that good. This isn't exactly Gordon Ramsay's five-star cuisine. 
beans, cabbage, eggs, onions, bread, and of course beer or ale to wash it down. The peasantry just didn't have the same access to food like royalty did. Although with a list like that, it sounds like it's a fast track way to an upset stomach or some really grody gas, dude. It was women who would often be preparing those delicious dishes. Besides the hours I would spend on the commode after visiting a commoner's house from eating that, the taste is something we're talking about, I think. When you guys are cooking chicken, for example, what are your favorite recipes, spices, flavors? Let us know in the comments, I'm curious. My favorite chicken is barbecue chicken. Brush a little Diana sauce. Medieval folks just didn't have that. More upsetting than that is the lack of spices in general. While there were some, anything not local would have been crazy expensive and not available to common folks. Medieval women did the best with what they could when they had it. That's just how it goes, Chief. I talked to him. He's a chef. He said it's all right. Number three, nuns. It makes sense, honestly. Becoming a woman of God was honestly a good career choice for a woman. For starters, you become a woman of God, and that means you're protected under his vision. Thank you, Jeebus. And people need that back then. Seriously. Secondly, it would also give you a place to live. Some nuns stayed in one town and others traveled where needed, staying in monasteries and convents where it was possible, and probably more comfortable than living in the mud and stone huts that the serf women were living in. And lastly, they got rulers and sticks, and if someone was bad, they would punish them when they misbehave. Oh, sorry sister, I didn't mean to say naughty words in the classroom. I guess you'll have to spank Chetty now, ooh. All jokes aside, this might have been one of the best things for a woman to be, besides royalty or marrying rich. It's just how the times went. Number two, landowner. I was shocked by this one too, honestly, but yes, women could own land. Sort of. It wasn't a blanket green light. It's a bit more confusing than that. Some could, some couldn't. There was a few rules here and there. They were stupid man patriarch poo poo rules, but rules nonetheless. In Normandy, for example, only men and their sons could possess land ownership. In the Basque region, both sons and daughters could inherit land. In England, both could, but if there were any surviving men or brothers, then they would be considered first, and not women at all sometimes. So, no, it's not as open as today, and you probably would catch some strange looks as a woman rolling up to an empty lot and staking your shovel in the ground. It makes life a lot easier if there aren't so many rules, and I know you guys agree with me at home. The less red tape, the better, right? And be nice to girls, be nice to women. Number one, artist. This one hits home. I think Chris can agree with me on this one. A lot of male artists, writers, and poets get remembered from history, but there was a few decent female ones too. We gotta give them some spotlight. Just It sucks that males get all the spotlight. To me, this makes sense. In my experience, a lot of girls I knew growing up had natural talent for arts. I remember growing up in school and art class was always one of my worst subjects. No, not because I didn't follow directions, but my art never came out the way I wanted it to. I, I didn't feel the motivation, babe. I couldn't see the motivation. Most of the girls in art class just passed with flying colors. No pun intended. And for writing, well, besides my dyslexia, if you looked at a paper I wrote in the sixth grade versus a girl from my classroom in the sixth grade, what's the difference? Well, you can actually read hers. I, mine are terrible. All grade school antics aside, notable artists and writers include Clerica Gouda, that's a cool name, and Hildegard of Bingen. Names you might not know, but for sure are worth a Google search. That Number 10, train engine cleaner. Ever wanted to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out the coal that was left in there? Ever wanted to go underneath a train where you can't fully stand up in the middle of the night and rake out a dusty ash pan, getting all kinds of ash and stuff in your mouth? Perfect! You can go join up with the railroad as a train engine cleaner. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains, and then spend their nights climbing into said furnace, cleaning it out, and then going out in the middle of the freezing cold, wet night into a trench covered in water and oil and dust, and get right up under that sucker and pull out all the ashes and dust and crap that came out of the engine while it had been running all day. Number Number 9. Linker Boy or Linker Men Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, the only gas lighting came in the form of small children who made you believe that you wouldn't be able to walk the streets without them tagging along with a torch to help guide your way. Then they'd expect a tip from you. Oh, rascals. They weren't so bad. They were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to point B while being able to see one foot in front of the other. And their charge was usually just one farthing, or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker boy, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from the time, and there were even some rather infamous ones, like Lawrence Casey, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. 
Oi, where are you going, mate? You forgot to like and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and while I've got your attention, why not take a little peek over at our Facebook, where you'll find behind the scenes content. Get on with it! All right, all right, bloody hell, bloody hell. Number eight, knock her up. No, not like that. God. Look. I despise my alarm clock. It wakes me out of my deeply deserved beauty sleep at 6 a.m. every weekday morning. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is a knocker up, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. If you had this job, well, you're not alive anymore, but I hate you. The people at the time were somewhat friendlier than they are now, and I'm sure the knocker upper wasn't a horrible person, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy gills who would put their hand on your chest for doing this to them. Number seven, a phrenologist. I think if this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna go and make up a science. It worked for phrenologists. They claimed that a person's personality, character traits, and abilities could all be figured out by bumps and indents on a person's skull. Characteristics like secretiveness, amativeness, conjugality, and combativeness were apparently controlled by areas of the brain that they called organs of the brain. The idea was dismissed by the church, but it nonetheless gained traction through Europe and was really popular in the States. The idea that you could modify these organs through self-control and practice sounded really good to self-help gurus at the time. If only it was real. Number six, a dog whipper. Looking for someone who absolutely despises dogs and doesn't mind being despised by the rest of us otherwise known as a dog whipper. Back in the day, huntsmen would often hunt foxes and nail their tails to church doors, which would attract dogs of the streets. You'd also have churchgoers who would bring their dogs with them to church. These dogs were not allowed in though, so they'd all have to wait outside. You know how dogs are though. They didn't just sit there waiting patiently. I'm sure some good boys and girls did, but more often than not, they'd be playing and sometimes fighting, disrupting the church services. Enter the dog whipper, who was armed with tongs to grab a dog and remove it from the church grounds, and a whip that would be used on the loudest of the poor pooches. Number five, a rat catcher. I know this will make a few of you out there squirm in your seats. Rats in Victorian England were a massive problem. They were everywhere every nook and cranny of your house, from the basement to the pipes. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So of course, where there is a problem, there is a job. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era and were highly praised in society, but the job wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into the dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and catching and often killing thousands of rats a year. Often rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats too. I don't know though, it's gonna be me. Number four, an upright worker. Upright workers, otherwise known as chimney sweeps, actually started off being children as young as the age of four. The smaller size of the little kiddos was perfect for fitting inside and climbing up and down chimneys. The little suckers would rub their elbows and knees up against the brick of the chimney so much that they would be scraped raw before callousing. Isn't that lovely? No. No, it's not. It's horrible. Some children were deliberately underfed to keep them small enough to do the job. Some of them would get permanent lung damage from the dust and smut and smoke from the chimney. Some kids even got stuck in the chimneys. Thank the Lord they eventually passed a law that would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to be a chimney sweep. But even then, tis not a profession many would like to have. Number three, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era. They definitely existed, as the first one was invented in 1823, but it was not exactly a portable thing. So matches were your match. The first match was invented in 1805, but it sucked. The first friction activated match came about in 1826, and they were made with white phosphorus, which is extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was actually mainly done by teenage girls and in the worst of conditions too. Forget protective gear. Oh, you wanna take your lunch break away from the highly toxic white phosphorus? Oh, no, no, no. That's right. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Mmm, yes, my favorite seasoning. Number two, 
Resurrectionists. Back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of the line. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around, which led to a good price for bodies that were in reasonably good condition other than being deceased. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea as now you've created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves, becoming resurrectionists. A cool name for an absolutely god awful profession, if you could call it that. The problem was bad enough that people would actually guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. No one should have to do that. Number 1. Night Soil Man Alright, if you need me, I'll be depositing my night soil over in the toilet. Poop. Night soil is poop. And the night soil men? Well, you see, before we had real sewer systems, the night soil you deposited at home would go into a lovely hole in the ground. As you can imagine, these would tend to fill up over time, and that's when you have your night soil men come in. Yes. His job was to clear out the poop deposits from houses and cart it away in the middle of the night so nobody in polite society would have to see it. But they were always in business, so that makes the job a little less crappy. Number 10, working in general. I know. World War I, 1914 to 1918. If you didn't guess already, this wasn't the age of women, or at least treating them right. Just wasn't. This, however, was the beginning of things changing. The war had a lot to do with that. When men went off to war, women had to fill their shoes in places of work. When, in reality, a few years prior to that, a woman working was a ridiculous idea. But what's a gal gonna do when she's got no choice? Knuckle up, buckle down, and do it, do it, do it. It might seem silly today to even mention women going to work, but this is good history. In the beginning of women's suffrage, really the middle of it. Number nine, this one's really cool, I like this one, this one's crazy. The Radium Girls. Yes, the Radium Girls, this is just a crazy story. So, this material called radium was discovered and its glowing properties were quickly put to work for military application. You'll find a lot of times that military service often boosts technology development. Just how it goes. So when a factory that was producing glow in the dark watches for the war effort needed workers, they looked to women to stand up to the challenge. Day in, day out, these women painted with radium paint. The women were advised to keep the brushes with a fine tip by placing it between their lips. Kind of just a little lick, a little, a little kiss, kind of, kind of cute. Some women even used it on their nails, and others painted on each other. The novelty of glow in the dark paint quickly wore off, however, when it proved to be very harmful to one's health, especially since the women had been ingesting the harmful paint. In the end, it was radiation sickness. One woman had it so bad her jaw simply fell off. That's not it. I saw the picture, bro. It's, it's, it's just gone. It's uh, uh. Number eight, the Canary Girls. A very similar story to the previous, but perhaps one you may be unfamiliar with. The Canary Girls sing a familiar tune to that of the Radium Girls, except it wasn't radioactive, but rather just TNT. How could TNT be harmful besides when it blows up, right? That's what I thought. The only trouble I've seen with TNT is when Wile E. Coyote accidentally blows himself up trying to get the Roadrunner. That's where I get all my scientific knowledge from. I'm a scientist, what can you say? Well, besides cartoon antics, TNT was quite harmful due to the chemicals that made it up. So harmful, it would make the women sick. It would turn their skin orange and hair yellow, like a big bird yellow. Yeah, that yellow. It even sadly affected children born whose mothers had been exposed to the chemicals. Canary babies, as they were so called. This is why we have work safety rules. And ladies, next time there's a global conflict, check what's in the factory first before they throw you in there. You don't want to catch any of that, that's bad for you. Number 7, Ambulance Driver. Chauffeurs and drivers were a man's job when cars began to take over the roads. You gotta imagine this is a time when cars are still really new. However, why use a man there when we could use him in the trenches? Many women were trained and drove ambulances from the battlefield staging area back to a safer safer area where doctors and nurses await your arrival. The pay wasn't great, there was lots of screaming, and a slight chance of getting shelled by German artillery. There's a part of me that always gets nervous while watching footage of this time period. Like the cars just look kind of flimsy, right? And they look like they could fall apart at any minute. And driving through the mud and the blood, top speeds only are going to be around 20 to 30 miles per hour tops. 
Car's got like 40 horsepower at most, which in case you didn't know is very slow. Usain Bolt on his best day runs twice that speed. I don't know about you, I, I hope you, you ever see that footage and the cars are so like, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't look they're gonna make it up the hill, it's weird. Number six, nurse. I know, I know. Yes, lots of ladies were, are, and going to be nurses. That's nothing new. And any nurse out there in the medical profession, Thank you for your service. Chetty thanks you. Now, I don't need to tell anyone in the medical profession how busy a hospital floor can be on a bad night. Nurses running around, paging doctors, phones ringing, papers flying, something about a code blue. Hectic, right? Well, imagine that, but less equipment. A hundred years less technology, and all whilst under the suppression and threat of bombardment. Great. Yeah, not so fun, right? Sure, any nurse has comfy sketchers to take her to the graveyard shift, but no nurse has blast-proof equipment to treat people in a graveyard, as this is a field hospital and this is the best they can do for the time being. Yeah, see, that's not fun. That's kind of unusual. It is. That's unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Number five, ladies of the trench. This makes sense. A lot of sense, really. And as weird and crazy as it might sound, it might have made the men feel a little bit better. Trench life was awful. Refer to my World War One videos here. They're pretty good, I promise. Mud, blood, rats, disease, sickness, machine guns, barbed wire, no man's land, chemical warfare, and sadly, when all that was done and gone, brutal, borderline, medieval hand-to-hand -hand combat. That just must be terrible. I played Battlefield 1, that's fun, but in real life, that's just not fun. So when soldiers were taken out of rotation for a little R&R, &R, they might be pleased to see a brothel on wheels. That's right. Or when visiting certain northern towns in France, a very legal brothel uh, houses, if you will. When Americans joined the fight, of 1,000 men being treated in hospital, 190 were being treated for a brothel related sickness. Go get them, boys. Some men would even ask for ladies who were known to possess such qualities because they knew if they caught it, it meant 30 days in a bed and not in a trench. That's honestly such a big brain play, I can't even. Number four, widow. Might not be an official occupation, but it is an official title, and officially, it sucks. Imagine a world where it's difficult to get by, a world where a woman is a second-class citizen. So when her husband, her brother, her father, and maybe even her son get drafted to fight Germany and don't make it back, well, it's, it's not fun. Some struggled to find work, others remarried, and some had no choice but to practice the time-old tradition of the world's oldest profession, if you know what I mean. Tough times, man. Especially for the ladies, not cool. Number three, farmers. Gotta tend to those fields, partner. This is also a time where there is farm equipment, yes, but not as common as today. It would have been expensive and nowhere near the state-of-the-art farm equipment that we have today. Milking machines, combines, tractors, you name it. In 1914, it's offspring. That's your farm equipment. That's how it works. Ever notice how farmhouses got lots of bedrooms? Well, if you can't afford to hire farmhands, then you make some. Except, however, the key issue with the last point, as well as here, is the men in your family getting sent to war. Not coming back for four years is a problem. Or, in a worst case scenario, not coming back at all. I mean, I'm sure some came back, they just came back in boxes. Which means wives, women, sisters, and daughters had to roll up their sleeves and get to work. And I don't have to tell any farmer watching this how important their job is, or how difficult it can be. You gotta feed the folks, after all. Gotta do what's right by me, Dutch. <laughs> I don't know why farming's western, but all right. Number two, dancer. Little bit of a stretch here, but hear me out. World War I ended in 1918. By 1920, the Allies' economies had picked up, but especially in America. This was a time of great success, as a wise man once said. The Roaring Twenties, while the war was over, many folks were still feeling the effects, especially in Europe. Germany wasn't doing too hot, and they're gonna come back for a sequel. It's not gonna be good. As the sale of alcohol was banned, underground clubs began to open. Speakeasies, you may have heard them from my 20s videos. Men, soldiers returning home, women and minorities of all backgrounds were hanging out in these places, which was very progressive and cool for the time. The ladies were becoming flappers, which were dancers, out of the factories and enjoying the luxuries of a healthy economy. And I'm sure some of it had to start in 1918 at least because they knew the end was coming. It had to. It just had to. Trust me, it makes sense. Number one, politicians. For the first time in a long time, women were becoming politicians. Not presidents or governors, but their voices were being heard in the political space regardless, which is huge. A one Miss Rankin was voted into the US House of Representatives in 1916. A woman's right advocate, all brought to you by women's suffrage. I don't have to tell you how unusual that really is for the time. 
especially for the time. Unfortunately for these ladies, while there would be some great step forwards like earning the right to vote and social progress in the 1920s, things would go back a few steps during the 40s and the 50s and wouldn't see massive resurgence until the late 60s and 70s. You gotta remember the good stuff though, even if it's baby steps. Number 10, knocker upper. All right, sounds a little different than its actual purpose. Hear me out. Alarm clocks, they're not great, right? They suck, no doubt about it. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real life person. What does that look like? What does that sound like rather? That's 6 a.m. That person is called a knocker upper, a person employed solely to wake up workers at mills and factories on those early morning shifts. Now going from house to house, using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows, that sounds like the best job ever, right? I can't close the list with this one. This is number 10 for sure, it's kind of fun. If you had this job, well, you're probably not alive anymore. I don't know, unless you live in a weird town. The people at the time were a lot friendlier back then than they are now, so you know I'm sure the knocker upper came around today. It'd be a little different. They'd probably be on World Star the next day. Knocker upper is back in the day. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for waking me up. I would have lost fourteen dollars. Thank you. It was a big deal. It was definitely a big deal. Number nine. The Linkerman. Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, if you were traveling alone at night, well, you probably get lost. Cause yeah, even London now would get lost, you know what I mean? So that's where a Linkerman would ideally come into play. They'd come in to save your night. What they would do is they would carry with them a torch to help guide your way home. They'd be like, hey, follow me, I know these streets. And then you'd do it, I guess. It's a little scary. At the end of this impromptu tour, they'd of course expect a little tip from you. Of course, of course, thank you for lighting my path and getting me home, cheers. Here's one nickel, it's actually a lot back then. Here's one penny, there we go. They weren't so bad, they were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to B, whilst also being able to see one foot in front of the other, that doesn't hurt, especially in Victorian London. You get to step on a dirty rat, that'll be gross. It's like a friend walking you home, only you don't know them, and it's the Victorian era, so probably pretty unsafe. 50-50 if you're gonna make it. And their charge was usually one farthing or the equivalent of a quarter. The Linker Man, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from that era. And there were even a couple famous Linker Men, famous Linker Mans, like Lawrence Casey, for example, who was the personal Linker Boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Imagine that, your arm must be so strong with that lamp all day. Ooh, it's just like, oh, I can't put it down. Number eight, ghost photography. 1800s ghost photography. Apparently it was a theme or a, a vibe, I don't know, but there are people that would take the photos of these ghosts. So at one point you would be hired as a professional ghost photographer. On paper, here's your tax returns. That's what I did. The camera, of course, was a hot new invention back then. So tales of ghosts and spirit were easily believed, especially when you have a photo of a see-through woman. That probably helps sell your tale for sure. Like, up oh, here she is. It's like, that's, that's mom. That's definitely not, you just did that in the back room. That's, I don't believe you. A big name in the ghost game was that of William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849, so now he's for sure a ghost. Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister, and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of the Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. Yeah, this British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a spirit. Imagine that, imagine a day where somebody was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and they also posed for photo ops with ghosts. Like, can we pick a lane, science or not? What are we doing here? Number seven. Grave designs, graves, but make them cool, you know? Customize your own pit in the ground. That's fun, that's grim. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, pretty much anything floating around your mouth and eyes, it was spreading and it was bad. Not a good thing to ingest. Not an ideal time in history. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark new fun trend. Yeah, here we go. The safety coffin. Yeah, let's uh, make your own coffin, DIY. These coffins, God forbid, you were buried alive while these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Yeah, some Tony Stark guy in the back's like, if you push this, the body will pop back out and come to life. It's like, really? A lot of these coffins were built with extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire, the safety backup wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground, and attached to a bell on the outside on the ground. So if somebody was walking by and they heard a bell ringing beside a gravestone, first of all, it's haunting, well, they know something's up and they can get them out. But folks would get creative with their safety coffins. They would ask the inventor to make them crazy things, like a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He had some odd requests. He passed away in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his coffin after he passed. This special door would reveal a layer of glass. 
Yeah. So if anybody saw any condensation, well, you know, he's still alive and get him out. Only he wasn't alive. And now we just have the world's scariest exhibit. Just a real life dead man. Let's close that back up forever. I don't want a glass coffin. That's disgusting. Number six, rat catcher. I mean, obviously you know what's gonna happen with the name the rat catcher. It's gonna make a lot of you out there squirm in your seats and I apologize in advance. Hit that thumbs up, you know, let's even out the energy. Rats in Victorian England, they were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your home probably had a dirty, fat rat just sitting there with its weird teeth looking at you. From the basement to the pipes, everywhere. It was literally a, it was a big problem. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So imagine that. So of course, there's a problem. So of course, where there's a problem, there's now a job, right? Someone's gotta do something about it. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era. I mean, of course, brave souls. And they were highly praised in society, but the job, obviously, wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and we'd catch them and you'd often have to kill thousands of rats every single year. And then deal with that. I don't even know how you deal with those bodies. Let's say bones, ew. More often than not, rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats, so. You have your own little animal posse hunting down other animals. You would feel pretty good. You'd feel like a, the king of animals almost. Probably not, eh? It's probably a disgusting job. You probably hate it every day. Number five, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing back in the Victorian era, obviously. I mean, they definitely existed. The first lighter was invented in 1823, but it wasn't like the ones we have now. Not like those Bix that still don't work. It wasn't a portable thing. The first match was invented in 1805, but it kind of sucked. And the first friction activated match came around much later in 1826. This one here changed the game for good. They were made with white phosphorus, which is of course extremely toxic, but they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was of course done by people, young women. It was only women that had to do this and in the worst of conditions, of course. And before you ask, no, they didn't understand protective gear. Well, they did a bit, but even so, women didn't get that kind of luxury, right? They didn't get that treatment. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would probably end up ingesting said white phosphorus the entire shift. History is horrible. Number four, resurrectionalist. All right, back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of their line, right? You're not gonna go dig up someone's wife and be like, hey, mind if I study her? He's like, no, please. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around to begin with, which led to a good price for bodies that were in, well, reasonably good condition to, you know, study up close, other than being, you know, deceased and disgusting. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, sure, I'll admit that. Now you've probably created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves. And that's exactly what happened. People would become their own resurrectionalist. It's a cool name for a god-awful profession if you want to call it that. The problem was so bad that people had to protect, like they had to guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. Or else these guys would come in and try and dig them up and sell your Nana for like 20 bucks. You have to stay there for four nights and guard her. That's crazy. No one should have to do that. The Victorian era sucked. No one should have to do that or this next one here. Number three, train engine cleaner. Yeah, this one's gonna suck. It sounds yucky already. For this job, you were required to get into, of course, pretty tough positions to, well, clean the engine of a train. Train engine cleaners would have to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out all that coal that was left over. Yeah, as if shoveling the coal in wasn't bad enough, now some guy's gotta crawl under and shovel it all out. Nope. They go underneath the train with a dusty ash pan and they work away all day long and nights. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains and then spend their nights climbing into the same furnace to clean it out. Every time I watch the Polar Express, it's always so magical, you know, it's always a great time. But even on the Polar Express, there's a guy shoveling coal all night long on Christmas Eve. You know what I mean? That's how bad this job is. Magic can't even save it. Couldn't even picture a worse job to have with this goofy back. Imagine that, imagine me doing this all day. No way, I'm gonna make it one week. Number two, funeral mute. Ah uh, yes, death. Happened quite a lot back then. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, you know, don't drop them, hmm? all that kind of stuff. Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Now Oliver Twist, one of the lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Oliver Twist is like, this one sucks, this one really sucks. Mutes were required to dress, of course, in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would be to, well, to stand and mourn and not say a thing the entire time. You'd have to stand at the door of the recently deceased home and just welcome death. Just embrace it, you have to be death. The mascot for death is now you. Horrible. In Victorian London too, you're gonna breathe in a fresh rotting body. Nice, that's good. I have about four days left, thank you. And after that point, you would lead the coffin all the way to the graveyard, nice and slow, like you were uh, leading a marching band. Only it's not music, it's death behind you. 
And finally, number one, a chimney sweep. I remember doing this when I was a kid. Okay, I got some questions now. I'm gonna make some phone calls after this list. I had to do this when I was a kid, but back then it was a lot worse. It wasn't a chore, it was an actual job. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young men. Guys, I can't say anything else here, but they were young lads. That's it. History is pretty horrible, right? You could fill it in. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that made it officially illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. Nice, I was 18 cleaning my chimney at home. I had no idea, I could have busted out this law and been like, actually, three more years, dad. See ya, just moonwalk out of there. I'm not cleaning anything, just the kitchen for now. I'm not using that tiny little brush. Why do all chimney sweeps have a tiny brush? Give them a bigger brush, you know? Kicking off the list at number 10, Plague Body Collector. Immediately into the dark and dirty. Here we go, we're not wasting any time today. Plague body collectors were vital back in the 14th century when bodies were quite literally starting to pile up. Somebody had to go in and somebody had to move them. That's pretty much this entire list. Eh, somebody had to do it. So using an old cart and a dirty rag only, they would have to carry plague-ridden corpses 28 city blocks away. Great job, we love it. They would also cover the bodies in flowers to prevent disease, or so they thought. Ah uh, yes, this tulip ought to prevent the plague. Number nine, galley rower. Ah, uh, my arms are tired just thinking about this job. Here we go, I gotta warm up. Back in the Middle Ages, if you were assigned to work on a galley, well, you better hope you were below deck scrubbing something with someone. Some sort of swashbuckler, something. I don't know, I've seen Pirates of the Caribbean once. If you were a galley rower, you would be tired all day long. Some large vessels had around a thousand crewmen. This was now a faster and more fierce way than any sail, but you needed a bicep or two, right? Benjamin Arbel, author of A Companion to Venetian History, states that back in the 1400s, a galley rower was one of the most detested obligations among Venice's colonial subjects. Yeah, obviously, they would do anything they could to avoid this position, which would sometimes include becoming a priest. Yeah, rowing a boat or Jesus, what's easier? They're like, Jesus, definitely Jesus. I don't blame them, I would hate that job as well. These noodles right here, this wouldn't do any good for any army. I'll complain about my arms being tired while in a paddle boat. You know what I mean? Think about that one. Number eight, cup bearer. One of the most important roles in the castle, of course, belongs to the cup bearer. I have a Yeti, also quite important. Yeah, these guys don't just sit in the corner and play the cup song on repeat, although that would be amazing. We're like, yes, more of that. This is the first piece of music we've ever had. No, they would serve royalty their drinks. They were responsible for making sure nobody has tampered with any cup. This was a noble spot to have. The king really needs to trust their cupbearer, obviously. The best part of this position was also the most dangerous. See, cupbearers were responsible for tasting the king's beverage each and every time. You know, to make sure there wasn't any poison. That's horrible. It's kind of good, though. I don't know. By the time dinner was over, Buddy probably had no idea which way was up. He's like, here you go, it's safe, and then immediately faints. Number seven, resurrectionalist. Yeah, you don't see a lot of these guys around anymore, eh? Wonder why, that's odd. A resurrectionalist is exactly what it sounds like. It's absolutely disgusting, and dare I say, a bit of hogwash. These guys were responsible for digging up dead bodies, and then they would sell them to medical schools. All in the name of science. Gross, disgusting science. This was in the late 1820s, and at this time in Edinburgh, Scotland, the medical science community was on the up and up because of these guys. But in order to study new medicines to, you know, avoid the next plague, they needed to get dirty. I'll, I'll tell you what they didn't need though. They didn't need William Burke and William Hare. See, these two Irish brothers, they were both resurrectionalists who were running out of patience and money. So they themselves would end up taking people out and then proceed to sell their corpses right after. They did this 17 times. They killed 17 people all in the course of two years. Then they sold their corpses to one Dr. Robert Knox. Yeah, it took 17 killings before somebody caught on to the system of theirs. Hare testified against Burke, so Burke got the old gallows treatment and was publicly dissected. His skeleton is actually hilariously enough, still on display at the Edinburgh Medical College Museum to this day. So if you wanna go flip off a skeleton, there you go. Number six, fullers. Ancient Romans were pretty creative, dare I say. That's what we'll say about that. Recently, we did a list on dark medical practices used in history, and in that list, we talked briefly about how urine was used by ancient Romans to, you know, whiten their smile. We love that, fresh breath guaranteed. They also used urine to wash their clothes. They didn't use soap because the amount of ammonia in your pee often did the trick. Again, 
creative. Lye was also used to clean clothes at this time, but it was pricey, so plan B was to head down to the old laundromat and then hand your dirties over to a fuller. Yeah, these lucky lads would have to stand in a tub filled with chemicals, water, and, well, yes, lots of urine, and then just stomp. Just stomp and scrub for hours. Urine collected from all over town. How lucky is that guy? And of course, most of the time, they would get extremely ill, obviously, just breathing that in. From one of the many poisons that they're splashing around in, that'd be the worst job. Ugh, this should've been number one, but it's not. Trust me, it's not. Number five, ewerer. Ah, yes, the ewerer. That's an easy word to say right there. Ewerer. Ewerer. While water carriers were responsible for carrying fresh water supplies throughout town, the Ewerer was responsible for nobles and their water supply. Yeah, see, these lucky lads had the misfortune of transporting boiling hot water. You know, for tea, hand washing, a hot bath, you name it, all that nice stuff. Anything you desire that requires boiling hot water from all the way across town, well, the calm Ewerer has your back. What a stressful job. Uneven stone roads, good luck not spilling all over yourself. Number four, a scribe. Scribes would copy texts, something that would take months, right? It would be a horrible job. My wrist hurts sometimes filling out my name. I'm like, oh, I haven't done this in years. You ever read the terms and conditions to an iPhone? Imagine life before copy and paste. You had to write that out. It was a process. I mean, first you had to convince somebody to let you, you know, borrow their codex. Yeah, people don't trust me with their phone chargers, let alone their codex, okay? You take that for months at a time, of course, at a high cost, a lot of trust there, because many didn't know how to write. And to be fair, if I magically got transported back to the Middle Ages, they wouldn't be able to read my chicken scratch at all. Also, ink? Good luck, no way. I cannot do it. I'm barely figuring out pens today. If you dabbled in calligraphy, this was the job for you. But again, it wasn't an easy job. Imagine trying to write out the speech of a drunken king. You're like, did he say wither or thither? I don't even, this guy's asleep. Number three, lector. Long before Spotify or even before the miracle worker herself that is LimeWire, if she rests in peace, couldn't have grown up without her, factory workers needed entertainment to distract themselves from the repetitive, horrible tasks all day long. I mean, we're talking about a time where women were making arsenic dresses for a living. This was long before the labor board ever existed, right? It was all bad. It's 1929, workers are treated like complete trash, so they decide to liven up the workday by bringing in a lector. A lector would read the news or literature out loud to workers all day long, every single day, out loud, with bad breath. It sounds like a nice gesture on paper, but in reality, factory workers were then forced to pitch in portions of their own pay in order to fund these guys. Yeah, they would have to make less money to hear Schmo Rogan talk about politics all day. That's horrible. Not everybody was on board here, so naturally thousands of workers ended up going on strike because, you know, this guy wouldn't shut up. I mean, some cases, sure, entertain away, but if you need to focus all day long, maybe using small parts, maybe you're repairing a watch or two, it's kind of hard to get your job done when dude's in the corner trying to figure out commas, you know what I mean? He's like, eh, and I'll huff, and I'll puff, and uh, what's this word? You're like, guy, I'm trying to make an arsenic watch. Please shut up. Number two, watching paint dry. Before we get to our big bad number one, I have to include this modern curveball. I can't believe this is a real job. This is hilarious. There's a man in his late 30s right now named Dr. Thomas Kerwin. Sorry, he's not a man. He's a doctor. A doctor who makes a living by watching paint dry. Yes, this man currently works for Dulux Paint, and he studies paint under a microscope and also as it paints on a wall. He has to time it. This makes sense. When fast drying paint is a main selling point, somebody, again, needs to do this job. Somebody's gotta figure that out, right? And that somebody here is Dr. Thomas Kerwin. What a champ, that's amazing. When asked about his profession on catersnews.com, Dr. Thomas replied, people think I stare at walls, constantly checking my watch, i.e. me, to time how long it takes. If that was the case, I would be bored out of my mind. Fortunately, when you look under a microscope, it brings everything to life. A liter of paint consists of a million billion particles. So there's plenty to see before the paint even hits the wall. A million billion, that's something like that's made up. Yeah, there's a million billion particles in this paint. 26.99 a can. Here you go. Look at this green. We actually painted this Dulux green. It was great. You wouldn't even guess. Number one, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls. Keep the business running while you're off golfing, you know, doing stuff that matters. 
Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool though, that, that's a bit much. That was a bit too close for me, I think. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see an online job opening for a groom of the stool, but you never know. I will definitely apply, let's do it. Back in the dark ages, this role again was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII and this role was to assist the king, specifically assist his bowel movements. Grooms of the stool had a box that they carried with them at all times, and that's where the magic happened. The dark magic, that is. And you would literally follow the king until he needed you. Porta potties weren't a thing at this time, and there's no way you're gonna catch a king squatting in the woods behind a bush. You're not gonna catch King Henry VIII like, hey, don't look, do you have any leaves? No, not at all. In fact, you wouldn't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for said groom of the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? Yuck. In this stool, you would have water, hopefully, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell? Uh, sight, hopefully, everything? Nope. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role, and in doing so, they also gain access to every single room in the castle, and tons of clothes, and any bedchamber, furnishings, anything they want, and of course, a higher pay. Kicking off the list at number 10, an arming squire. Being a knight, okay, obviously this sounds cool on paper. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing lady, the gal on the back of said horse. They're saving the damsel in distress or something, right? Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, but that's just what being a knight is all about, right? Also, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones nine years ago. It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. First of all, this process starts when you're seven years old as well. So you would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you became a squire. Ah, yes, a noble squire. We've heard this term before. What do they do? Uh, well, it's, it's a knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but it's a job nonetheless. Also, you had no choice, so you, you had to do it. Welcome to the Middle Ages. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it. Yeah, how fun is that? Oh, which buckle was it? Ah, uh, yes, that one. Mm. Yeah, fixing up chain mail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal, welcome to the Dark Ages, pretty dark. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor. Yeah, everything. A Lot of yuck going on in that business day. This was long before Dawn soap was also a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, gross, so gross, it gets worse and worse. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Number nine, Plague Bearer. Yep, this one's as awful as it sounds. The title of this one really gives it away. Ah, the hot summer of July 1665. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague in the Dark Ages? Where do we put them? What do we do? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time around. So now what? Well, a plague bearer, he's got your back. Church wardens would organize burials, right? This was a normal thing even back in the Dark Ages in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a little bit. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. How grim is that? But it's probably a great call, all things considered. Poor guy. Number eight, a knight. When we think of the knights and you know the dark ages and stuff, we often forget about the silly royal duties that one had to attend to. Yeah, you thought jury duty sucked. Oh boy. Beastly justice. You ever heard of this? If not, buckle in. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. Yeah, they were put on trial as well, as well as humans. It's wild to look back at a knight and all the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact they also had to wake up early and attend court like a noble, like royal court where a wild animal was now taking the stand. Like, what a joke. I'd be like, really? Do I have to be here? I woke up at 4.30, what's going on? Yeah, this would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, you know, being confused and being an animal and all. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was somehow involved in this whole ordeal. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself, right? How weird is that? In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, apparently. But instead of just, you know, setting the animals free or putting them down or whatever, they just took them to court. A real court, like a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say that we gotta do a list on that. That's a terrible job. That's one of the worst jobs ever, I, I lightly introduced here. These pigs were then hung from a gallows tree. It was so horrible. The dark ages, dark, right? A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. Yeah, being a knight sucked. Number seven, leech collector. I always enjoyed catching frogs growing up. That was always fun, but apparently I, I gotta step my game up. 
<laughs> this is weak. A leech collector is, well, exactly what you think. Back when medicine was pretty much non-existent, sickness was just wafting throughout these old towns, just eh, moving through towns. Like the G from the Goosebumps logo, just haunting towns, moving through. Scariest intro ever, eh? So the solution back in the day was the classic, oh, if you feel sick, maybe try bleeding for a bit. Mm, see if that helps. Yeah, they would use horses' legs to lure out these leeches, but most of the time, these leech collectors would have to get in and get dirty and just grab them themselves. They would have to swim around and touch as many things as possible. They would make contact with as many leeches as possible. How gross is that? That was the best way to collect them, really. I would have fainted so often, that is horrible. The loss of blood here was obviously so intense, so it was a you know horrible job to have. And on top of that, you gotta look out for the same reason they need leeches in the first place. Disease, yeah, that's still out there. Leech collectors were so common throughout the 18th century that leeches basically were extinct at that point. We almost lost leeches. Oh, so close. Number six, jesters. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century, so pretty OG. These fools were hired to liven up the party, you know, dance and be silly, wear pajamas. Most of you have an image of a jester in your head, you know, jumping around on tables, telling jokes. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, it was pretty fun. It was one of the best jobs to have, obviously. This title of a minstrel or a fool, rather, it was an honor to have. The fool's payment also was was no funny business, that was good stuff. Roland Le Petier, he was like a major jester back in the day. This guy got 30 acres of land from King Henry II. Just here, here you go, to show up and fart and be funny. Have all this land. That's like a kingdom, you have a kingdom because you're funny and you're silly. He would whistle, jump around, and literally fart on people. On Christmas day, this guy would come over and just ruin your entire breakfast and just be like, yeah, I have all this land. And then he would take off. It's crazy, you just ruined Christmas, sir. Stop farting on my food and family, thank you. I would never want to be a jester. They had to also like go into battle and like spread bad news too. It was fun and silly, but they were also royal. They had to do lousy stuff too. Number five, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants, you know, to grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off, you know, doing your businessman stuff. Assistants are vital today. The groom of the stool though, that was, uh, huh, that was a bit much. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see any online ads opening for a groom of the stool. We'll see though, fingers crossed, I had good benefits. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII and this role was to assist the king and specifically assist his bowel movements. You had a box that you carried with you at all times. That's where the, that's where the magic happened. The dark magic happened in this box. You would literally follow the king around until he needed to go to the washroom, until he needed said box. Porta potties weren't a thing back then and there's no way you're going to catch that king squatting in the woods. In fact, you wouldn't even catch that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom Oh, the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl. The whole setup would be in there. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room in the castle, tons of clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, you name it. And of course, a high pay. Always helps, thank God. That's maybe the worst job in history, maybe. We're almost there, you'll see. Number four, divorce lawyers. If you've seen Game of Thrones, you've heard of trial by combat. That was the that was the norm back in the day. You know, you fight for your freedom. That's great. But what about divorce by combat? What in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith is happening? Was this real? I can't believe this. If you and your significant other weren't getting along in the dark ages, instead of, you know, dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork and getting it done with and going your separate ways, no, instead they would battle each other. Like combat. It was an organized event too. It had restrictions in place for the husband. It's pretty hilarious to think back on. Like the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back while the wife ran circles around this hole with a sack full of rocks. A sack full of rocks, how intense is that? That's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot, okay? Just take the barn, take the horse, take it all, I quit. Get me out of this hole, untie me. Number three, toshers. Toss a coin to your tosher, here we go. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even a legal job. Shh, don't tell. If you don't need, uh, if you don't need toshers, Keep, keep their secret, you know? Early 19th century London, I know, a little more modern here, but definitely worth a mention. These toshers would spend all their time in sewers below London trying to find coins or valuables that have been just accidentally washed away. Yeah, they would just search for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim, or reclaim rather. It was worth the plunge as well. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year. Just gotta do this a lot, and you're good. Number two, dentist, doctor, surgeon, spy. 
Dentists were not a thing in the Middle Ages, you know? Dr. Downer didn't politely tell you to floss more and then shake your hands while you're watching a show getting a cleaning. No, it wasn't like that at all. They did have a barber. They had one guy, he did it all. A barber from the Dark Ages. Yeah, this appointment is gonna suck, my friends. Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a molar, they would only pull these teeth. That was the only solution. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, you know, the classic three-in-one appointment we all have to do every month. Doctors were seen throughout history and they've seen a lot of horrible stuff. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of their legs. Yeah, instead of cutting the tip off and pulling the opposite way, the arrow removed would come in and then, you know, cut into the injury, opening it more. That's always great. And then you would hold it open and then you'd pull the entire arrow back out of your leg. Yeah, what a fun job. Or chest. Wherever the arrow went, you had to figure that out. It's poor soul. And finally, number one, the rat catcher. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do like rats, like rat tricks and they have like cool rat friends. That's awesome. I'm not one of those people. I'm not bashing you, but I am bashing this job. This would suck. First of all, rats as a medieval punishment was horrible. Where do I even begin with this one? This was one of the worst punishments for the rats as well. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. A rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped to his abdomen or chest. And then inside this enclosure, they were rats and they were also like tucked away. And then historically, they would heat the uh, metal enclosure and the rats would panic and try and get out and they would chew through the softest part, which in this case was your chest or abdomen. It was horrible, it was an absolute nightmare. But these rats had to come from somewhere, or rather someone. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in, or rather out of a castle. It's an important role, you know, just like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet. There needs to be a chasseur de rats. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease, and with these castles being big and dark, there were probably a lot of them hiding. Black rats were a common household problem, so we need to get those out. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try new spells to get rid of the rats. Wasn't always helpful, wouldn't work. More often than not, didn't work. So poison powders were the next main trick here. Also the Pied Piper, he was an OG historically. He would do a musical number to exterminate your pets. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. Any rat catcher actually, today or back in the dark ages, you deserve a bonus, my friend. You're a brave soul. Number 10, Thrall Traders. Now look. Vikings weren't all that bad. Sure, they would go off to other countries and lands and raid and pillage for a bit of sport. They'd de-life you and your family or they would take the people from your village that could do some good manual labor and bring them back to the market where they were sold to other Vikings as thralls. But okay, you know what? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really making this any better. Uh, the selling and purchasing of actual people has unfortunately been a successful business strategy in almost every single corner of the world for as long as there have been people to do it. And the Vikings were not exempt from this. While it was a standard way of living at the time, the people who actually auctioned off thralls for silver and gold pieces or for goods like furs, weapons, livestock, and food, by our standards, were the worst of the worst of people. To make the life of another human being nothing more than a product is pretty disgusting. Gotta love how people just always treat each other so nicely. Life for a Viking thrall was anything but pleasant, but they were a part of Viking society. We'll get to that later though. Number 9. Hunters Yes, a lot of Scandinavian life had domesticated animals. We wouldn't be here without that. But this isn't the time of industrial agriculture. You can't just walk into your local butcher and demand to speak to the manager when there's a lack of product. Trouble is, I think a lot of modern folks just don't know how difficult the process of hunting can be. Now, hunting is a way of R&R, &R, a unique hobby that can give you a respect of nature and where your food comes from. Or it's a way to binge drink in a small cabin with three other men trying to get away from their wives. Vikings just didn't have it that easy. No catch, no food. For my taste though, in a time before gunpowder and rifles, stick to the small animals. Trying to take down a bear with arrows, that, that just can't be easy. Number eight, shipbuilders. Vikings got around, all around, not just Europe, but a large part of the known world, even discovering places all by themselves. They were experts at building boats. They had dragon ships, nars, merchant ships, and a whole bunch of other kinds of water vehicles. But the most famous of all their ships would be their longboats. They used longboats to travel the world and to go on their famous vacations when they would go Viking. 
The dudes responsible for building these things are also responsible for the nightmares they gave all the monks and soldiers who lived in England and other European countries, assuming they survived. Imagine, it's a nice, crisp morning. You're just waking up for the long day ahead of you. You step outside to take it all in. Oh, what's that in the distance? A large, flat-bottomed oak boat with the head of a serpent or a dragon with 50 to 60 large, hairy, sweaty, angry-looking men who are coming to put you in the ground or kidnap you, take your stuff, and burn your house to the ground? You know who you have to thank for this? Yeah, it's the Viking shipbuilder. Number seven, blacksmith. Being a blacksmith is a very difficult task. Red hot iron, hammers striking and forging the metal that makes our lives possible. Sure, we don't use them as much as we did in the past, but someone's gotta make horseshoes. Shout out to all the equine lovers out there. I see you. The point I'm getting to here is that in a time before power hammers and modern techniques, it's a long process. It takes time and skill. Some might even call blacksmithing an artisan craft, especially since a lot of the things that required a blacksmith to be a blacksmith, like making swords, obviously, and shields and spears, but you gotta think about everything else. Door hinges, iron fittings, bolts, brackets. It's an important job in the Iron Age. What's messed up is how dangerous it is. Anyone working with metal will tell you how rough that can be. In a time before hospitals, burn treatments, and antibiotics, I would be careful on the grind wheel. Number six, settlers. Life in the Scandinavian countries was not easy. Summers were like two days long and winters would last so long Andrew could actually move his box over to finish filming on time. Hey! A large percent of the Vikings were farmers, but the soil there was not good. So as more and more Vikings were born and families grew, some people decided to jump ship and move away, or try to. They'd show up in England like, Hi, so I know we kind of just like totally raided you or whatever, but um, <laughs> we would love your land and we're gonna settle here, okay, cool. This was usually met with the pointy end of a three foot sword. They would settle in areas like Britain, the Netherlands, Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, and Russia. Some successfully, some not so much. They did successfully settle Iceland and Greenland though, with their population in Iceland reaching like 50,000. When they went to Vinland, otherwise known as Newfoundland, they settled for about five minutes before the Native Americans drove them out. Being a settler back in the time of the Viking was a necessity for some, but a death wish for most. Number five, Fletcher. I used to be an adventurer like you until I took an arrow to the knee. Somebody had to make these bad boys. Archery, it was an important part of medieval life. Just look at the long bowmen of England, they'll tell you. Bows and arrows may not be the first thing you think of when talking about Vikings, but judging from text, art, and other evidence suggests that archery played a major role in Viking life. Chances are, if you saw a longboat coming into your shores, there would be some burly blonde haired dudes with bows ready to find their targets. There's a part of me that thinks this is one time the player can blame the controller, or the arrows for that matter. Not every arrow is going to be perfect, so if something goes wrong, you can go back to base and yell at young girl. Number four. Law speaker. So, in Viking life, there were some rules and laws that applied to all Vikings, and some that were specific to each village or town. But they didn't have law books. There wasn't any kind of written law at all. No, instead, one lad from each town would go have the special task of being the law speaker. This was one person in town who would have the lovely job of memorizing every naughty thing that the members of the village weren't allowed to do. When a council meeting, which was literally called a thing took place, he was there to remind everyone of any law that was forgotten or to listen and memorize new laws that were made. Then he would waltz on down to the village law rock and recite that law to everyone who was not part of the thing. Now imagine if you forgot a law or if you worded it differently and that caused someone to find a loophole or imagine if you were someone who the law speaker didn't like. That guy can mess up your whole day. If the punishment for a crime was not death, it was sure damn close enough being exiled into the cold, harsh wilderness. Look, the Vikings came into contact with enough cultures who made a habit of writing things down. Get with the program. Number three, thrall. Hey, I don't like it. Nobody likes it. It's YouTube's least favorite S word, forced manual labor, or 
you know what I'm talking about. Vikings were kind of twisted in that department, honestly. Like Adam said, sometimes for fun, they take you away for some good old fashioned manual labor. Also, like Adam said, this was a very successful and profitable business strategy. If there weren't laws that made employers pay a minimum wage, well, I'd hate to see a world without those laws. You know what I'm saying? It's a terrible thing to find yourself in. Well, there were some sort of sick buyback freedom program going on, the thrall system does echo with serfdom in the rest of Europe, which if you look around, isn't around anymore. Probably for good reason. Number two, traders. Vikings weren't just mindless brutes who would run around plunging their axes and swords into people, getting drunk and wearing little to no clothing. I mean, yes, there was a fair share of that, but they were also very handy, excellent craftsmen and explorers. As they grew, some towns became trading centers, importing and exporting goods from lands far away. Through Russia, Vikings came into contact with Chinese and Persian traders who gave them spices and fine silks and amber. They would barter with things like weapons, furs, walrus ivory, and fish. They managed to get wine from France and Germany. But while these Vikings decided to trade in the danger of robbing for a more diplomatic profession, they still had to travel. And while they may be making hella bank, that doesn't really matter when you and your longboat carrying all your goods ends up at the bottom of the ocean. Like we said earlier in the video, Vikings were amazing boat builders, but they were not masters of the elements. And if Thor decides it's time for a storm, or if pirates got you in their sights, you gotta deal with the consequences. Number one, beekeeping. I'll admit it, I may be a cute husky guy who reminds people of other overweight comedians. I love candy and Farley too. And maybe sometimes I fart too much. But as it turns out, I have some fears too. I know, who would have thought? One thing I'm not cool with is flying insects, especially the ones that can hurt you. I don't like those ones. Bees and wasps, ironic, I know. My little honeybees, I know, right? Who would have thought? I've never been stung before and I don't plan on it. With my luck, Adam's a super villain with thousands of bees at his disposal. Who knows? With all jokes aside, the Vikings had honey, which probably means they had some sort of beekeeping going on. We're not sure, however, how they did it. What I do know, though, is that they had no protection or smoke blowers. Maybe they did. Ah, tell you what, I'll enjoy the honey and let the crazy burly men take care of the harvesting. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the leech collector. This job truly is exactly what it sounds like. It's a person who is responsible for the collection of leeches. The little blood suckers were a popular treatment back in medieval times when just bleeding was a common treatment for a variety of ailments. Headache? Just bleed a bit. Common cold? Have I got a solution for you? Bloodletting, especially by way of leech, was actually used medicinally for thousands of years with possible ties to ancient Egypt. This medical treatment, however, of course, required leeches, which meant that someone needed to collect them. Many leech collectors were people who didn't have a lot of money, and more commonly, women. The job required wading in the water and searching for leeches, and how do you catch them? With your legs, of course. Leech collectors would wait for leeches to latch onto them, and normally would have to wait for about 20 minutes before before pulling them off because they were easier to remove after getting fat with blood. How horrible. This already sounds awful, but what's worse is that after being bitten by a leech, the wounds tend to bleed more than a normal cut even would. This was great to get more leeches interested, but bad as a human who is trying to keep blood inside of their body. This job usually led to those who did it to contract illnesses from the leeches, their open wounds, or just have severe blood loss because at the time, people didn't know you could overdo it with bloodletting this way. In our Number 9 spot today we have the fuller. Wool is a clothing staple. It's been used for centuries, but back in medieval times there was a disgusting part of the job that thankfully doesn't exist anymore thanks to the invention of modern chemistry. Wool is naturally waterproof due to the fact that it contains oils that have been distributed from the sheep's skin. And these oils are what made the entire harvesting, carding, spinning, and weaving processes possible in these times. This is all fine and well, but the trouble comes in after all of that because the cloth at the end of it all was coarse and easily frayed. And this is where the job of a fuller came in. They were tasked with removing the oil from the cloth. Okay, a little alkaline solution, no problem, right? Well, yeah. Except for in these times, the most accessible and cheap alkaline solution was stale urine. Yep, just a bunch of old pee. A fuller had to take this new woven material, put it into a tub full of old pee from who knows where, and then you stomp on it with your feet. And then you get no shower at the end of it either. What's a carpenter? 
without his tool belt, right? What I mean is that fullers were also responsible for collecting their own pee to use for the wool, so they often needed to head to all the local public toilets and private homes to collect it. Just gets worse. In our number 8 spot today we have the groom of the stool. This job doesn't sound too bad with just the title, it weirdly sounds kind of regal. I mean, it was quite a prestigious position during this time, but it also was one of the most humiliating jobs in history. In the medieval times, kings were looked on almost as if they were gods, you know, it's their divine right. And because of this divine right, for centuries it was deemed improper for a king to wipe his own behind after using the facilities. This is where the groom of the stool comes in. This high level nobleman would be responsible for fetching the toilet chair for the king when nature called, and he would also be in charge of the wiping aspect of the whole thing. No bidets, I guess, back then. The groom of the stool also played a role in monitoring the king's health as he was tasked with examining the stool just to watch for any serious changes. And should the king be having some digestive troubles at any point, the groom of the stool would always be nearby and ready to administer a royal enema. In our number 7 spot today we have the nightman. This is definitely one of the shittiest jobs from the medieval times and I mean that quite literally. Also referred to as gong farmers, these people had the unfortunate job of cleaning out all of the human waste from the cesspits in the castle walls which they would then transport to a pre-arranged location where it would be buried. These cesspits were the medieval equivalent to a septic tank and they were usually located on the lowest level of the castle. The nightmen would end up digging through weeks, months, just sometimes even years of disgustingness and they were motivated to gather as much as possible considering the fact that they were paid by the ton. Imagine, that's a frightening amount of work. The job was also quite hazardous too. I mean if we really think about what exactly they are doing, it quickly becomes clear that many of them died from disease and there was also a good chunk of people who suffocated on the job as well. In our number 6 spot today we have a sin eater. Okay, This is definitely one of the strangest jobs on this list. The job of a sin eater was to, well, eat sins. To do this they were tasked with eating a piece of bread that had been placed on the chest of someone who had died. Definitely not an ideal day of work for me personally. The idea behind this was that in consuming the bread they were consuming the sins of that person so that they could carry on into the afterlife peacefully. Basically sin eaters were willing to sacrifice their own souls and their own eternal happiness just to make some money while they were alive. I'm not sure what's worse, taking the risk with the sins or eating bread from off of a dead person. You know, both bad. In our number 5 spot today we have the executioner. We have all heard of this job before. After all, an important aspect of the medieval times was the fact that they were trying to have better criminal law enforcement, which naturally meant that a ton of people were getting executed for their crimes. While there is of course now the stereotype of people who did this work as being these huge hooded evil people, history shows that this stereotype is largely untrue. Most of the people who fell into this job didn't come into it because they wanted to. In fact, most people People of course saw this job as being undesirable, but the job usually was bestowed upon them. Sometimes butchers were called for the job because of relevant experience, other times it was criminals who could either do the job or face their own death sentence, and most commonly people found themselves in the job because their fathers had been executioners before them. Aside from the nitty gritty of the job, I mean the horrors of the work itself, it's obvious, another part of being an executioner that sucked was the fact that people didn't really want to associate with you. Execution Executioners were usually on the fringes of society and outcast, sometimes even forced to actually live on the edge of town. In our number 4 spot today we have cat gut. Back in the medieval times they didn't have the technology we have now, or even the technology that was available in the 17th century when it came to making strings for instruments such as the violin, but they still did have violins around, so how? Well, in comes the invention of cat gut, which thankfully is not made of cat guts, but it is made of sheep's guts. Okay? really had you in the first half there. Violin string makers during this time would make the strings by basically twisting strands of sheep innards together. Their job would require them to butcher the animal in a very careful way, making sure not to rupture the stomach or the lower intestines. The process could take hours just to get the required materials from the animal. The insides then needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution for a good cleaning, but they needed to be monitored at all times to ensure that they weren't beginning to spoil, which is horrible. From here the drying process began and after that it was time for twisting. In our number 3 spot today we have
have the rat catcher. Another job that really is just what it sounds like. Rat catchers had quite a busy time during the medieval times. There was a rat problem and these rats were filthy and full of disease and someone needed to catch them. Castles were often filled with extra grain, vegetables and herbs in the case of emergency and this led to the perfect environment for rats and mice. Even before the connections were drawn between rats and disease, people hated them and this is because they would eat your food. A bad rat infestation for a person without much actually could have been a death sentence for them during this time. This meant that people really appreciated rat catchers in society, although the job wasn't a great one, was clearly risky, and also was largely ineffective. Rat catchers would sometimes try and use spells, sometimes they would use herbs as a sort of poison, and sometimes they'd even use the good old leave the body as a warning to the other rats trick. Yeah, wonder why it didn't work. In our number two spot today, we have the treadmill operator. This is a job that sucked during the medieval times because it was boring, it's basically like a human hamster wheel, but also because it was incredibly dangerous and not for those who were afraid of heights. Treadmill operators would normally be placed at the highest point of a structure and the wheel they were stepping on was the top half of like a pulley system to help things be hoisted up as they were building said, you know, structure that they're at the top of. This is a practice that started in ancient Rome and was reintroduced in the Middle Ages. This was actually a job that was commonly given to people who were blind because the fear of heights dissuaded a lot of people from doing this job, which only makes it probably more dangerous. In our number one spot today, we have the lime burner. Lime mortar has been a common and important building material for years, stemming back to the first century BC, but despite its importance, it's not exactly easy to work with. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone, and this was the job of a lime burner. They needed to take the stone and heat it in a kiln at around 800 degrees Celsius. Sounds easy enough for sure, except for the fact that the job meant that you were constantly being exposed to rooms full of carbon monoxide and dust chalk that was capable of removing your ability to breathe. And also, just to top it all off, there's also a high risk that once the stone was done heating, it might also explode if it comes into contact with water. So. Better hope none of your sweat drips down onto it or else things are not good. And at number 10 is jewelry making. Egyptians saw deep spiritual significance in their jewelry, but also had a love of aesthetics. And those two things combined to create some of the most unique and lavish jewelry found in history. Worn to ward off spirits, protect health, bring good luck, and more, there were even certain colors and designs that were associated to certain gods and powers. And so Egyptian jewelers followed very strict rules regarding the mystical aspects of their jewelry creations. While a woman usually would not be a metal worker in Egyptian society, it was very common for her to be making jewelry. The tools were smaller and the process required less heat and thus less danger for her. Metal work techniques included precious metal sheets that were cut and shaped, notched together. Wire work was accomplished through strip twisting. Pieces could be held together with this wire stripping system or crimping techniques. These strips were also how link chains were accomplished, as well as the securing of beads or the backs of ears. And for jewelry designed exclusively for burial, the metal was often quite thin, as the jewelry of the deceased was not subjected to the wares of everyday life. Precious stones, ivory, real flowers, and shells were all common ornaments, as was name engravements, but it was more common with royalty. Jewelry makers were women of high status due to these contributions and the revelry jewelry held in ancient Egypt. For number nine, it's house vendors. Recognized as an ancient heritage profession and was at its most popular during time periods of ancient Egypt where women were restricted from going out when married. These vendors would roam neighborhoods with buckets and baskets of product for sale. Clothing, perfume, fabric, snacks. Now what was unusual is that the vendor was more often women than men. Walking the streets alone, making these sales because many married women weren't allowed to go out walking the streets alone to make sales. You see the irony. Anyways, this profession found great popularity in single women and many also were called upon to act as nurses in homes of the wealthy when needed. The career is named Al Dalala, but the idea itself has long been extinct with the freedom for Egyptian women to roam commercial districts. Number eight is being a dancer. Ancient Egyptians loved their music and dance. They were celebratory, but also ritualistic at times. Farmers would dance to thank the gods for a good harvest. Dance groups would perform at banquets. People would 
go dance around the Nile in the lush season. The list goes on. Many men and women chose dance as a career, and it was a highly respected one. Dancing was considered an acceptable and normal part of life and even important to it. Most festivals were incomplete without it. In fact, dancing was such a revered career that dancers could start as a peasant and become a high status person from it. Just like being a celebrity in the way that people would go to see them perform. Women at the time were even more revered for their grace, elegance, and acrobatics. This career had seven types of dance. Gymnastic, movement, pair dancing, imitative dance, which was like acting like animals, group dances, like a historic cheerleading squad, dramatic dance was female exclusive and rested in illustration, war dances, grotesque dance, and then religious chant dances at temples, and lyrical dance, which was usually a depiction of lovers. Wig makers are number seven. Egyptians loved wigs for a reason that surprises many. It helped keep their heads cool. I mean, it also helped with hygiene and scalp pests and looking pretty, but the heat thing is what really gets folks. Many Egyptians had shaved or cropped hair, and the mesh-like base of a wig versus a headscarf allowed the body heat to still escape. And as said, wigs were also a great shield from lice or other invasive bugs. The hair used in the construction of wigs and hair extensions was always human and was either an individual's own hair or had been traded or bought. Hair itself was a valuable commodity ranked alongside gold and incense in a count list from the town of Cahoon which puts emphasis on the popularity of wigs. When hair was collected for a wig, it was thoroughly combed and then sorted into lengths individually. The Egyptians invented a variety of hairdressing tools and the wig makers would take the time to braid or coil the hair depending on the wig style, coating each with warm beeswax and resin fixative so that it would harden when cool. The job itself isn't unusual, more so the booming industry it had. Wigs weren't worn to this extent anywhere else at the time and while yes they were functional against the sun, they were more so aesthetic than anything. Individual braid and extensions could also be attached to someone's scalp for aesthetics, the way that box braids, twists, faux locks, and many other ethnic hairstyles are accomplished today. Wigs were made in a type of factory setting. Archaeologists have uncovered the remain of wig factories, wig boxes have been found in tombs, and multiple mummies have been found with wigs or braided in extensions. Number six, we meet our ladies of the night. Unlike most ancient and even modern civilizations, selling intercourse is illegal or was highly governed. In ancient Egypt, this was wasn't even close to the case, but rather the opposite in a peculiar way. Women who worked in the sexual industries were considered divine and respectable, as their career was considered to please the gods. They earned high status and lived in luxury. Working freely and openly, these ladies adorned themselves with red lipstick and eye makeup that differentiated themselves from other women. They were also tattooed, diamond shaped dots along the thighs and on the fingers or images of the god Bess. When the French invaded, they brought STIs, and they spread rapidly through the brothels, and this prompted the French authorities to introduce a law forbidding French troops from entering the brothels or having these ladies in their rooms. Guess those ladies were hard to resist because anyone who offended the law received death penalty. Number five are the wet nurses. Wet nurses are found in all statuses and were for all statuses. One common denominator though is that the career kind of really sucked, pun intended. So first their social status was always determined by the status of who they were breastfeeding. Royal family, congrats on your special privileges, statues, private quarters, and your own tomb in the family pyramid. Also, her family would receive special perks as an extension of her. Now, royal families only wanted high status wet nurses, and while it's not clear how they were chosen, evidence suggests some kind of blood tie or faint familiar relation. Most wet nurses were from marginalized families in lower socioeconomic statuses and worked under conditions and pre-definitive wages. Wet nurse requirements for any status were intense. She'd have to have given birth at least twice, have a large but healthy body due to the belief that large bodies were more nourishing, Despite that, her breasts should be medium. Too small, not enough food. Too big, the baby's spoiled. In addition to all of these prerequisites, the wet nurse should be sweet-tempered, affectionate, and responsive to her charge. She should also abstain from intercourse because it could reduce her affection towards a child, and they also said no alcohol. A good call, knowing what we know now. Wet nurses were women exploited for the products of their bodies. As slaves, they were coerced for their milk. As lower social status women, they were employed for their bodies to enhance their inadequate domestic status. Even her own household suffered physically and monetarily if a wet nurse defaulted or failed a contract. On the 
same page, surrogates are number four. This is a widespread practice in Egypt. The first story of surrogacy found in Genesis 16 of the Bible was the story of infertile Sarah having Egyptian Hagar carry her child for her and her husband Abraham. Even Egyptian pharaohs had used concubines to produce heirs. They often married their sisters or aunts, and children born of these marriages were most of the time not in great or functional health and wouldn't survive. Any child born of a concubine for a pharaoh was accepted as his lawful offspring. Now, they were quite limited in their rights and they could only inherit the throne in case of the absence of another more entitled heir. Surrogates experienced similar contracts and status leveling as wet nurses. They were desired to be mothers already, have a bigger, healthier body, and naturally beauty was a desired element as well. Women of low status who made a career of surrogacy often died in childbirth or from hemorrhages due to the repetitive birthing process, but for some, it was the only career they could have. Priestress is number three, and so while it was a male dominated field, many women were employed as a priestress or a high priestress at the temples around Egypt. Mostly from upper status, many were married to the priests, which they owed their position in society. Despite this, they played roles in the temple rituals, such as servicing goddesses Hathor, Neith, and Paquette, or working as dancers, musicians, singers, and acrobats in the temple. The most important priestress was known as the god's wife Amun. This woman was usually the daughter of the pharaoh or sometimes his wife. She usually held a very high position in court and performed important rituals to honor the god Amun. The priestress was in charge of managing the gods' affairs, attending to ritual dances and performances, shaking their rattles and rattling their necklaces, which were long and heavily beaded objects. By the beginning of the New Kingdom in 1550, the title Chantress of Amun was used, and it was usually the wives of the priests who gained these elevated positions as well. The concept of a woman as a priest was unheard of in many kingdoms. A high priestess and the reverence and traditions of female gods being led by women were unusual to outsiders of Egypt who oftentimes restricted most priestly activities to just men. Number two is professional mourners. Okay, so here's a weird one. Professional or paid mourning is an occupation not only found in Egypt, but in China, the Mediterranean, and Eastern Europe. This practice is literally paying a stranger to attend a funeral to lament, deliver a eulogy, help comfort the family, entertain, or lay on the ground wailing. There's some range here, depends on what kind of funeral you want to have. These paid mourners made ostentatious displays, messy hair and smudged makeup, wailing, pounding on the ground or their chest, throwing themselves about as they smear dirt and sand all over their body while they scream. It's a full spectacle. Now, another depiction of the paid mourners in Egypt is a little more chill. Two women impersonating the goddesses Isis and Nephthys. They were believed to play a special role in someone's death. Most inscriptions of a funeral where they are present as paid mourners, they are on each side of the corpse and their bodies are fully shaved. These women also had to be childless and have a tattoo of either Isis or Nephthys' name on their shoulder. Most evidence of professional mourning is seen in pyramids and tomb inscriptions, such as women holding their bodies dramatically in sorrow, braced over a casket with tears flowing. If you were a theater kid, this was definitely the type of job for you. And number one, it's the female physician. Egypt is a difficult one with historians. There's been a lot of largely ignored discoveries due to the opinions of those who found them. The evidence of women in ancient Egyptian medical fields is part of that because as it turns out, their physicians were actually primarily women. Evidence shows women in the medical profession going back into early dynastic period Egypt when Marit Ptah was the royal court's chief physician in 2700 BCE. She was the first female doctor known in world history, but there is another unnamed female physician who is listed to be the head of the Temple Neith Medical School in 3000 BCE, so maybe not. But either way, the first female doctor was in ancient Egypt. Women were highly respected throughout Egypt's history and many of their goddesses represented facets of health. Neith has been associated with the invention of birth and Hathor represents fertility. Four deities associated with healing are Heka, Sekhmet, Serket and Nephritim, which are all female. So, bizarre claims you may have heard that no women are involved in Egyptian medicine don't accord with the values of their civilization, which were incredibly equitable. By this reasoning, there were no women involved in anything of no anywhere in the world until the modern era, because history books make no mention of their contributions. But it's all up to say. Number 10, the leech collector. I'll start you guys with an easy one today, because trust me, this list, uh, 
well, it gets very gross very quick. Leeches were used in medieval medicine to help stop bleeding or to purify you of one of the four humors, you know, bile, black bile, all that business. Now, usually I wouldn't be agreeing with medieval doctors because, well, it's not a good idea, but there is some merit to the leeches cleaning up blood. It's still done today, mind you, in a much more controlled situation with antibiotics on standby. Etc. In the oldie times, someone had to go get them though. Someone had to roll up their sleeves or, well, actually keep them rolled down and walk into the swamp or whatever murky water there was and pick up the slimy bloodsuckers. It can be worse, as I'll prove in this list, but it's still not a great, it's, it's not fun. I wouldn't want to do that. Pick up leech salt and then, like, you go home and, like, gee, I feel really tired today. And you look at your leg and you're covered in leeches, it wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be great. Number nine, groom of the stool. We've talked about this job before on Bumblebee, but Taylor and I think it's very funny because. Well, yeah, it is. It's pretty funny. Basically, it's like having a bathroom attendant. Sometimes if I eat too many Slim Jims, candy, beer, and Taco Bell, I get an upset tummy, which means I'll be on the toilet hunched over wishing to God I didn't have extra hot sauce on my tacos. Well, imagine if there was someone there to help you, someone to just talk you through it along the way, perhaps offer a conversation, a breath mint, and more importantly, aid you in cleansing the royal bottom. Ooh, yes. That's right, back in ye olde England, there was someone who aided the king in his bathroom duties. Funny enough, it was actually a well-respected position. Just, you know, keep some hand sanitizer nearby so you can just clean up after. I, I wouldn't want to do that. Number eight, the vomit collector. Here we go, folks. Romans, opulent partiers and conquerors of the ancient world. Can you just imagine what one of those parties was like? Oh, I'd love to go. If someone has a time machine, let me know. Call me. Well, supposedly, as the legend goes, the Romans were so opulent, so greedy, that they would vomit to make room for more food and treats at the most greedy of feasts. Well, this wasn't exactly a modern age, so the vomit wasn't going into a toilet or a modern plumbing system. Sometimes just on the floor. So someone had to come over and clean up all that refuse. Yes, that's right. The vomit collectors. Their job was to clean up after all the wealthy people emptying their stomach contents just so they could fill it back up a little more. Or a lot more, because it's a buffet and a, and a feast. Gross. Number seven, Fuller. Fuller? How could this be bad, I thought to myself. What's a fuller? Well, folks, in a nutshell, it's someone who treats sheepskins, animal hides, tanning. It was very important in the past. We used animals for a lot of products back then. It's kind of how we lived. With that being said, the process of which is not very desirable. Sheepskin is actually quite difficult to process without the use of chemicals. Well, and the uh, only readily available chemicals at the time uh, were urine. Oh boy, I just get, don't want to puke thinking about it. The skins were soaked in urine and then processed. The urine was often collected from multiple people, and oftentimes the fuller would go door to door saying, Right then, have you got any wee for me? That's wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'll be right back. I got a pot full. Well, give me a second. Are you having a good morning? Are you having a good day today? Right, it's a good day, man. See you later. Thanks for the wee. That's just so. Ugh. Gross. Number six, match girls. Women in the workforce. Tough, dedicated, and in the numbers. Truth be told, I don't know where we'd be if it wasn't for the Rivet Rosie generation, especially during the World War era. I, I really don't know where we'd be. Couldn't do it without you. Well, let's take the match girls, for instance, who work day and night to make the very new and effective phosphorus match. Ooh, one strike all, baby, love it. Their job was to take little itty bitty pieces of wood and dip them into a phosphorus solution. Bada bing, bada boom, you got yourself a match. That's how it goes. What's gross is that after years of working there and inhaling the vapors from the chemical soup they were working on, well, it, it, it had some pretty nasty side effects. It would cause cheeks to have a strange glow about them, and most commonly gums to bleed and have an awful smell pouring out of your mouth. That's, that's not good. The only cure was to have an infected jawbone removed. Oh, that does not sound good. I don't like that. That's not good. Number five, the mudlark. This is the scavenger of scavengers. The Victorian era was a very interesting time, and it was very tough to be a poor citizen. It's tough to be poor anytime, but especially back then. That's why mudlarks existed, not your average day-to-day -day paycheck. The mudlarks would comb the streets, riverbanks, canals for... Well, anything of value, which back then was a lot of stuff. I mean, there were doctors constantly looking for subjects to run tests on, like a science fair gone wrong. The mudlarks would often walk and walk some more in hopes of finding anything, sometimes even barefoot, because, well, yeah, they were poor too, and in need of a little help themselves. This meant that they were often knee deep in occupational hazards, like sewage, freezing water, rats, bodies, bones. 
and anything else that you can imagine, nobody wanted. Yeah, not good. Number four, a sewer technician. It's a dirty job, but somebody's gotta do it. Today, modern sewers are tunnels and intertwining well, tunnels that lead our least desirable filth to their final destination, whether that be the ocean or hopefully a purification plant, there's one near me. Sometimes, however, especially in older cities uh, that haven't been equipped with the proper upgrades, these sewer lines can get clogged or jammed. Happens more than you think, actually. And when that happens, you don't call the Ghostbusters. Venkman's not gonna help you here. You call the sewer technicians. Their job is simple, maintain the sewers and unclog the holiness that awaits them below. Imagine a whole city's worth of filth that gets flushed down the porcelain throne. And seriously guys, stop flushing wipes down the toilet. They're not flushable. The, don't do it, it's bad. But yeah, they go and unclog it and, and then everything's good and I hope they have a nice hot shower waiting for them because boy, they, they, they need it. That's not good, they need it. Number three, hoarder cleaner. It's a tough situation and it's a really tough job. Hoarding disorder affects thousands worldwide. It's a mental disorder that causes severe distress, anxiety and fear when the thought of even parting with a mundane item, eventually causing an unhealthy literal pile of stuff in the home that affects the person's mental and physical health. It's a bad, it's a bad situation. If you've ever seen that show on TLC, you know how gross it can get. Seriously, it's bad. Animal corpses, human refuse, and a collection of McDonald's toys that you forgot about. Everyone's got some of those. Well, when these places need cleaning out, someone has got to come over and do it. Gloves, respirators, hazmat suits, they got it all. All to get yelled at for trying to throw out piles of garbage, which the person can't help, but it's just like I said, it's a bad situation, man. Tough job. You're cleaning up poo-poo, and you get yelled at for cleaning up poo-poo. It's not, it's not a good time. Number two, the rat catcher. The industrial revolution literally changed the fabric of society. Now there's lots of factories where people would clock in and clock out for a steady wage, whilst enjoying their position in the workforce, producing goods and products at an unknown level. Previously known, that makes sense, sure. But this also meant that cities got bigger, streets got more crowded, and that meant lots of rats living and loving it in that filth. That's why there were rat catchers, because there were so many rats. It was more than a problem, it was honestly an epidemic. The catcher would rub oil and thyme on himself to try and catch the rats with their bare hands, where then they would then be released elsewhere, but that kinda doesn't really, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta not do because they'll come back. It's not, a, not a good solution. Number one, the crime scene cleaner. I don't think I could ever do this. This is, this is bad. It's all fun in primetime television when the cool detective takes off his sunglasses and makes a very low-hanging fruit pun about the crime scene he's standing in, followed by some super-level DNA lab work and someone hacking a mainframe. Oh, it's all great. What great television? But someone has to clean that up in the real world. After all, if there wasn't someone to clean up those crime scenes, most Hotels across America wouldn't have any rooms to rent out. But yes, there are people that do clean them, and yes, it's gross, and yes, I, I, I do, I'll fast out if I talk about blood, so no more thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Number 10 on the countdown is the cat's meat man or woman. We all know that the Egyptians worship cats, as many cultures do. But did you know that the cat overpopulation in the 1800s London area created a job called cat meat sellers? Always one of the most popular street sellers of the 1800s. If you think they sold cat meat, you're entirely wrong. Don't worry. These vendors were actually selling meat to cats themselves. Primarily horse, it was said that 26,000 horses that were maimed or past their workability were slaughtered a year for London's reportedly 300,000 street cats that were existing in the 1860s. When the cat's meat seller appeared, feline owners were encouraged by their cats mewing to bestow upon their favorite pet a delectable treat for a mere half penny. You may be wondering how this could be one of the worst jobs to have. Well, pushing around a hot stinking cart of horse meat has its cons, such as disease and rot. Depending on where you sold, you could be making a fortune or you could be barely scraping by. The hungry and homeless would often follow, harass, and sometimes burn burglarize cat meat sellers for meat or money. Also, their stalking behavior did scare off clientele or drew more complaints from the commoners. Personally, I couldn't think of something cuter than a little trolley going around town delivering food to kittens. Prepare to go downhill, however, because this next job is a lot less lighthearted than cat meat delivery. At number nine in our countdown is the resurrectionists. Money was tight for many, as I had mentioned, but how low are you willing to go as a person to get what you need? Well, if you're willing to dig up somebody's grandma, it could put hundreds in your coin 
coin purse. In the early 19th century, the only cadavers available to medical schools and anatomists were that of executed criminals. It was also mandatory for medical students to do an autopsy to graduate, and they had to source their own body. This demand for bodies was often unmet, resulting in medical schools and their students offering extreme amounts of money for the delivery of a fresh body. Thus, resurrectionists are born. Sneaking into cemeteries at night, they would prowl around for a fresh grave site and then dig up the recently deceased. However, bodies could only be sold if they were within a certain time period of freshness. And as grave robbing became more common, many family members of the recently deceased would take turns standing guard for nights in a row to ensure that the body lay undisturbed until it was considered unsalvageable for cash. In 1832, the Anatomy Act was imposed due to the actions of William Burke and William Hare, who are believed to have murdered 16 people between 1827 and 1828, just one year, all to sell to the University of Edinburgh. This act did give doctors and anatomists greater access to cadavers and allowed people to leave their bodies to medical science, overall helping end the resurrectionists era. While sourcing the dead may make for a fat paycheck, I think this is a profession nobody should attempt to resurrect. Speaking of the dead, have you ever considered eating off their lap? Okay, well, not quite literally off their lap, but number eight on the countdown is sin eaters. Sin eating is a job that really only affects you if you have a discomfort with death or a religious slash spiritual. It was believed that when someone religious was to die after a life led of sins, such as gluttony, lust, pride, or crimes and cruelty towards others, their family would sometimes feel that the only way to guarantee their loved ones access to heaven is through someone living taking on the weight of their sins. While the act is against the church's wishes, sin eaters go back as far as the 17th century. Depending on the family or the deceased, the meal served may be specific, but traditionally it was just a piece of bread. Placed on the chest of the laid out body, it was believed to supposedly suck up the sins of the dead, clearing them for a passage to heaven. Once the sins had been captured in the bread, the sin eater would sit on a stool facing the door and eat the bread before washing the bread down with a bowl of ale. Because he was a man who would willingly take on the sins of other people, he was often solitary in the community. However, sin eaters fetched a pretty fair price for the act. I mean, if it is true that you're taking on someone else's bad karma, you'd at least want to be compensated for that, right? Sin eating remained popular in England and Wales all the way to the turn of the 20th century when England's last sin eater, Richard Munslow, died in Rattling Hope in 1906. Like sin eaters, our next job was one of public scrutiny and rejection. Number seven is mudlarking. Victorian mudlarks are the original foragers of the foreshore. They would be scavenging for anything on exposed riverbed, which they could sell in order to survive. This was the last ditch resort. People would hike up trousers and wade their feet around in sludge, feeling with toes as well as fingers for items that may be lost or discarded in the mud. All ages participated in this activity. However, it was usually those who were the most affected by poverty that were taking part. As a result, those seen mudlarking were considered shameful and the lowest of society. River Thames was the most famous for mudlarking in the Victorian era, as it was renowned dumping ground that saw endless amounts of product travel through. It. it was also a highly impoverished area, which made the desperation to make money all the more grand, filling their water banks with the poor. Mudlarking actually isn't out of practice nowadays, but it has changed significantly. Nowadays it can be a fun group or solo activity that on occasion does require a permit. You can join mudlarking groups or do tours while traveling. It seems that sifting through garbage was an unfortunate trend in the Victorian era as toshers make number six in our countdown. Toshers, a fun word to say, the job, not so much. Unlike mudlarking, which was in the riverbeds, these workers went underground for their winnings. The Victorian era saw the development of sewer systems, and the poor saw opportunity in them. Toshers descended into the sewers to sift through raw sewage and find any valuable that may have fallen down the drains. It was extremely dangerous work, as noxious gas fumes formed deadly airless pockets, and since sewers were newer, the tunnels frequently crumbled from inefficient building. There were swarms of rats that had little fear of humans, and at any moment, the sluices might just open for a fresh wave of filthy water and feces to come crashing through. After 1840, it did become illegal to enter the sewers without permission. Rather than abandon the trade, toshers began working late at night or early in the morning to avoid detection. It may have been a stinky job, but it was also one of the most profitable on our list today. I guess you'd go nose blind after a little bit. Right? Hopefully. On a warm summer day, the last thing you want after jumping into the lake on your cabin trip is to emerge covered in leeches. However, in the Victorian era, that would be a prime location for the leech collectors, which are coming in at number five on our worst jobs countdown. Leeches are nowadays seen as little more than slimy and creepy creatures, but believe it or not, they used to be a valuable commodity in the fields of beauty and medicines. This job was often fulfilled by poor women living in the country and farmland regions. Wearing shorts or hefting up their long skirt, these women 
Penguin would wade into dirty ponds and waterbeds alike with exposed legs so as to tempt the leeches. When enough leeches were attached to them, the women would climb back out of the pool and scrape the bloodsuckers into metal pots and bowls. Seeing as leeches can survive up to a year without food or in their natural environment, this wasn't always a profitable trade unless you could find someone in dire or consistent need of leeches. Doctors did use leeches to aid in the caring process of all sorts of conditions, ranging from a stomach ache to joint pain to female hysteria, if you know what I'm talking about. Despite being used in medicine, leech collection posed major threats of deadly diseases and blood loss to their collectors. Suffice to say, I don't think I have any interest in going to a doctor's office if I'm going to be prescribed a leeching. Being given the duty of helping prevent and stop the spread of disease in your community would be an incredibly high honor, but maybe wait to sign that job contract until you hear the details. Nightmen definitely make it into our worst jobs countdown, taking the place at number 4. These men would wander the streets at night working what may be one of the most revolting jobs imaginable, collecting human feces off the street for proper disposal. They would dig up the feces from chamber pots, street wells, ditches, sewer holes, you name it. By the time the sun would begin to rise, the carts would be full of the city's excrement, which would then be carried off and reused as fertilizers for the crop that they later consumed. Yummy. Part of being one of the only people up at night means you're a valuable set of eyes. There are reports of nightmen catching burglars or SA in the act, or being called to bloody scenes by members of the public to provide alibis. There's also hundreds of cases where nightmen are the ones to find bodies of those who had met their ends out on the street. After a long, solitary nights of collecting feces and seeing these crimes unfold, a nightman would collect his 23 shillings, which is $75 today, at the end of the week and go home to rest before starting it all over again. Since we're already discussing dung, let's get this next one out of the way because it somehow may genuinely be a little bit worse than the last. At number three, this is the Pure Finders. Please do not be deceived by the name because this job is anything but pure. In the Victorian era, tanners, who are leather workers, would use dog dung in their practice. Referred to as pure for how it purified the leather and ensured its soft flexibility, dog dung became a hot commodity due to the Victorian demand for leather. Leather was being used for just about anything as it was the hottest trend of this era. It was also being used for things like tack for horses and the necessary creation of shoes and books. To meet demands, tanners needed more dog dung, and so pure finding became a career. These finders would go deep into the cities and their sewers, trying to find where stray dog packs amassed so they could score the biggest load. Whenever dung was found, it'd be retrieved and placed into a covered bucket that would later be sold to a tanner. To make it a little worse for you guys, only some collectors wore a glove to protect their dung handling hand. But others considered it harder to keep a glove clean than a hand and they opted out of the protection altogether. Yeah, think about that one. I feel like if this next job didn't exist, then maybe we wouldn't have needed the cat meat sellers from our first point in the countdown. Considered one of the most disease riddled jobs of the Victorian era, it's rat catchers coming in second on our list today. The government was smart. It knew its people were suffering and that many were starving and struggling to make ends meet. So they issued a statement willing to pay people to deal with the rat infestations. Every rat would earn people a little extra cash. If someone could catch more than 5,000 rats in a year, they'd earn special privileges. While 5,000 sounds like it would be a lot, it's essentially 13 per day, and it only takes 21 to 23 days for a rat to give birth to its litter. I think you can do the math. It's said that the government's encouragement of rat catching in this time was the stepping stones towards more plague and diseases to come, as desperate poverty driven people made poor attempts to catch these rats and caught the illnesses from them. Others cheated the rules. Some people actually intentionally bred rat colonies to supplement their captured rodents. Rat catching became such a lucrative business that gangs formed around it. And murders even took place when the cheaters were discovered or if somebody infiltrated somebody else's ratting territory. Between the venomous competition and high risk of disease resulting in death, it's safe to say that rat catching may have been one of the worst jobs. And now, what may be the worst of the worst for number one slot, let's learn about the history of matchmakers. No, this isn't the romantic kind of matchmaking unfortunately, but it's rather the business of matches itself. Working what was often a 14 hour shift, matchmakers were predominantly women who were immigrants, living in poverty, widowed, just overall in a bad situation for an era where women had pretty much zero rights. They were compensated poorly, often sexually 
faster assaulted by their management, and even forced to pay fines to their workplace should they be tardy or damage anything they worked on. Working with white phosphorus, the material found in the tip of the match to enable the instant strike anywhere effect, was highly toxic and responsible for a devastating disease known as Fossy Jaw. This nickname was given by the matchmakers to the particularly nasty condition that would cause the jawbone to rot and become disfigured. Eventually, this infection would spread to the brain and cause debilitating symptoms and extreme pain prior to death. Should the jawbone be removed in time, some women were able to survive longer with the condition, but nothing was guaranteed once Fossy Jaw had set in. Famously, an article written by a matchstick girl named Annie Besant exposed the conditions of matchstick companies in London. Infuriated, the factory owners fired her and attempted to force signatures of their other staff, stating that they were happy with their working lives. Refusing to do so, by the end of day, 1,400 women had gone out on strike. Their demands were eventually met, but only 20 years later. It wasn't until 1906 that white phosphorus was made illegal in the use of matchsticks in the UK. The matchstick girls were a revolutionary step towards the deliverance of women's rights and autonomy, a journey that we're still on today. Number 10. Nightman. Oh, the name Nightman sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? If you're part of the Nightman, you might be a guild that watches over the dark, you know, protecting people like a superhero team, fighters of the day man, master of karate and all that. Well, if only life were that cool. No, you definitely would not want to be a Nightman. A Nightman was a very polite name for a job that boiled down to guy who cleaned human feces out of the cesspit. Yeah. You ever use a septic tank and thought, wow, this is prehistoric technology? Well, imagine a medieval precursor to a septic tank, if you will, and you've got yourself a cesspit. Easily one of the crappiest jobs in human history. Now, the name makes it sound like you'd only be doing this for a few hours, right? Were it so easy, humble nightman? Nightmen would dig for weeks at a time gathering their goods, as they were usually paid by weight, not hours. Consider that, and then consider that any of the lovely amenities you and I have to avoid bacteria, masks, sanitizers, these guys had never even heard of and were shoveling stacks of crap by the literal ton with their hands and faces uncovered, huffing in unimaginable fumes. I imagine that's the kind of work that changes a man on the inside forever. Number 9. Fuller Perhaps one step down from the humble work of shoveling refuse all day like a nightman is the honest life of a fuller. You see, a fuller's job was to remove the oils from cloth woven from sheepskin and wool. Wool, naturally waterproof thanks to the oils on the sheep's skin, but the underside is very coarse and easily frayed and therefore needed to be dealt with before it can be made into things. Nowadays, we would just use an alkaline solution, call it a day. However, back then, chemistry sets weren't really like available, so you'd have to make do with what you had, right? And what better source of natural alkaline than in pee? Specifically old pee, nice and stale. We're looking for that burnt sienna orange. So the fuller takes the woven wool and cloth, soaks it in a nice giant tub full of old pee, and then stomps on it like you're crushing grapes for wine. Except it's not at all like you're crushing grapes for wine because you're stomping on wool full of old pee. It was fairly common as well for fullers to, uh, to source their own alkaline solution, for lack of a better word. There was no royal distributor of old pee. You couldn't stroll up to the pee man, so they'd have to scrounge and collect it themselves. And if that meant heading to public toilets and private homes, knocking on the front door with their hands held open for a big handout, you know, every drop counts. I can't believe I'm getting paid to say this. Number eight, a whipping boy. Have you ever heard the expression whipping boy to be someone's whipping boy? I know I've certainly heard it a lot, but the history of it is actually pretty fascinating. It was a real position. And basically your whole job as whipping boy was to take the licks for a misbehaving royal. When you have an up and coming noble figure, a prince, a duke, this sort of thing, when they're being taught by their tutors, it would be an unimaginable offense to strike the royal for misbehaving as their status was leagues above the tutors. But you can't have someone misbehaving without any retribution at all, right? A little negative motivation to push you to work harder and learn harder. That is where a whipping boy comes in. The whipping boy, sometimes a friend of the prince being taught, would be struck in front of the prince in order to motivate him to not commit the same transgressions. It seems a bit like a bit of a flawed system because from what I know of medieval European history, 
It's that kings and princes were rarely remembered for their generosity and compassion for their employees. Now, bizarrely, whipping boy was actually seen as a fairly desirable position since it meant you had like an in with the king. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure many young princes saw the guy who was being beaten over the head with a broom and thought this man is my equal and my confidant and a trusted ally. Number seven, groom of the stool. Ah, now this is a fancy sounding job title, groom of the stool. Got a bit of an air of quality to it. In truth, it actually was was a bit of a respected lofty position. You had a very close hand to the royal throne. You had a very close hand to the throne. You had your hand pretty much behind the king's bottom at all times. The groom of the stool, to put it gently, was the royal wiper. You see, there's no one bigger or more important than the king, right? The king is like a god amongst common men, and no god should have to debase themselves to something as absolutely humiliating, as dehumanizing as using the bathroom by yourself. So that's where the groom of the stool triumphantly strides in, washcloth in hand. You were kept on retainer whenever the king felt nature's call. You were instructed to fetch the chair and take care of business. And the wipe? That's all you, that's all groom of the stool, baby. That's your moment to shine. And you know, a lot of grooms really got creative with this. They could show off their style, technique, wrist control. There's a lot of artistry to it that I think people realized. The groom of the king did more than just fetching and wiping too. As the man most connected with royal stool, the groom also shared the responsibility of monitoring what was going on down there for any changes in the king's health. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, but much heavier is the hand that wipes the bottom. Number six, cat gut. Okay, in contrast to the last one that had a nice name, this one has a disgusting name, cat gut. Way back when in yesteryear, they didn't have the same tools available to us now when crafting musical instruments, so they had to get creative. If you wanted to hear something beautiful on violin, you couldn't just head on down to Long and McQuaid and pick up a pack of strings. You'd need a guy willing to get his hands wrist deep in some cat gut. Now, confusingly, no actual cats were involved, but plenty of sheep were. Violin strings were made of sheep's guts and they would make the strings by twisting strands of sheep's intestines and innards together. Lovely. They'd have to be careful while butchering the animals to make sure they didn't accidentally harm any of the goods. This process would take hours out of time from the butchering, the careful removal of the organs, and then they needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution to be clean since they were inside a sheep, and then stared at for a few hours to make sure nothing was going wrong, and then the drying process could begin. They say there is nothing more exciting than watching sheep guts dry. And then you can get your twist on, make them into violin. Absolutely disgusting, but when you hear the sweet strings of Ave Maria, and you hear how finely tuned those sheep intestines are, you know it's all worth it. Number five, Sin Eater. This is one of the most metal job titles around. I'm pretty sure the Sin Eater was a boss in Elden Ring, wasn't he? He's in Caelid somewhere. This is definitely one of the more unholy jobs in this list. Not as disgusting as gut stringing or crap slinging, but pretty horrid in its own right. Sin Eaters ate sins, and the best way to eat a metaphorical concept of wrongdoing was to eat bread off the corpse of someone who died recently. The idea being that the sins of the man would be transferred onto the bread, I don't know. Anyway, they eat the sins and the deceased gets to go off to heaven without worrying about their history, could go on peacefully, and the sin eaters make some coin. They were willing to take a risk dooming their mortal soul for a bit of coin. Man's gotta eat. I wonder though, is it worth it? Like what if you eat too many sins and you don't have any room for dessert? Do sins have an added flavor? I imagine it's got like just a little kick, like a sriracha, like it's a little hot on your tongue. Number four, lime burner. Now a lime burner doesn't sound so bad at first. Lime mortar is a common building material, being traced back to the first century century, but it's not particularly easy to work with. Bear with me while I try to explain the technicals. I'm not as smart as a first century engineer, you see. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone, taking the stone and cooking it in a kiln at around a cool 800 degrees. It's not too bad, right? Well, that carbon monoxide has got to go somewhere, mostly in the air. All that carbon monoxide and dust chalk would just float around in the air where you'd be taking big, heavy, deep breaths in. And I'm not sure how much you know about carbon monoxide, but it's consistently the number one spot on Rolling Stones magazine list of top 100 substances to not breathe in. On top of this, did you know that superheated lime mortar is violently volatile against water? Meaning that if you were to sue, you know, sweat, in a building that was 800 degrees at any given time, it would have disastrous consequences. Be careful. 
Number three, rat catcher. It doesn't sound fancy, but it's exactly what it says in the tin. You catch rats. You gotta wonder why you wouldn't just outsource this to the cat community. They're very good at this sort of thing. Rats, cute as I find them, at the time were filled to bursting with plague, disease, all kinds of grossness. Castle stockrooms were filled with grain, vegetables, and herbs, and if you're a rat, those are the things that make life worthwhile. Rats were a problem for nobility, but an even bigger issue for common folk and peasants, because if these little rats ate up what little grain you had, you would go destitute fast. But oh, come on, who can say no to their little posies and their little eyesies? I'm biased, I love rats. I would be a rat catcher if I could. Some rat catchers allegedly were reported to have raised their own supply of rats in order to squeak a few extra dollars out of the town. That's hilarious, by the way, love that scheme. Now, traditionally, their methods would involve things like leaving out traps or poisoned herbs. That wasn't always enough, though, so rat catchers would also invoke the old methods, namely, magic, and try to entice rats away with spells. This often didn't work terribly well since rats are naturally resistant to magic, like everybody knows this. Number two, plague bearer. The plague ravaged London and Europe, leaving behind a wake of bodies and a stack of corpses as high as your medieval eyes could see. So somebody had to deal with all of that, right? A street sweeper of sorts was needed? You remember in Monty Python and the Holy Grail when Eric Idle is going around ringing his little bell telling everyone to come bring out their dead? Hilarious, right? Well, it's partly based on reality because this is more or less what a plague bearer really was. The parish would hire out plague bearers who would then tour the streets of the village or town or whatever, wagon in hand, collecting the bodies of the ailing and dead to go dump in a mass graveyard shortly after. Tons of fun! They would spend their nights surrounded by dead bodies and their days in the church with the same dead bodies because according to the church's law, they were required to live there to prevent spreading what they were dealing with to anyone else. This might be history's first case of social distancing. And finally, at number one of the jobs you don't want is executioner. We've all heard of this one, and we're probably conjuring up a pretty vivid image of a burly shirtless monster in a black hood with a big ol' axe or something, wielded by someone who can't get enough of their day job and love their passion of separating necks from heads. In actuality, medieval people weren't that psychotic, and most executioners didn't join the practice out of a love of the game, but were usually coerced into it. Some were butchers who were called to the job, some were criminals who could do the job in exchange for a reduced sentence, but most commonly, it was a family business. If your dad was the town executioner, it was very likely you would be next in line to wear the hood. Now the downsides to this job seem immediately obvious, unless you're super into bloodshed and death, it's Probably not the cheeriest job. Seems like the kind of thing you'd, you'd take home with you, you know? It's kind of hard to lay loose and relax after that. But you know what's worse than the weight of taking another man's life? Social isolation. Executioners were not particularly well liked, looked down upon as outcasts, sometimes even forced to live outside of town. Ah, oh, well, you know what, executioner? It could be worse. You could be the groom of the stool, you could be a nightman. So, count your blessings. 